I think we're already ready to go. So we're going to go ahead and get started. Happy Tuesday, everyone. Welcome to the Committee of the Whole. We're going to start today with a presentation from the Grand Rapids Whitewater Summer Science and Leadership Program. So I would um, like to welcome uh, John Green. And uh, John's going to come up here to the podium and introduce this great group of students. And then we'll get about a 10-minute presentation on the work that they've been doing over the last couple of weeks. <coughs> thank you, Mayor. Uh, and thank you to the commission for giving us time to, uh, to present. Uh, we have just a real short 10-minute presentation. Uh, there is a, an event this evening at the Public Museum. Uh, doors open at 5 with comments at 6 if you want to learn uh, a bit more about muscles and some of the other topics that were explored over the last two weeks. Um, but we want to thank you for uh, inviting us here today. Um, first of all, uh, just a quick um, background on how this started. Uh, I like to say, like all good things, it happened over a beer. Um, Chris Muller and I were talking about how it, it really surprised us how many people have never been in the Grand River. Um, and on our first day in this program, these students were in the Grand River. Uh, you'll see some of the photos up there uh, in waders. And uh, it's been an incredible period of time. We've had a lot of support from Grand Valley Metro Council, uh, also from the Grand Rapids Public Museum. And uh, unfortunately, uh, David Koning, who leads the program, was not able to attend this morning. That's why you get me. But uh, we're very grateful. Um, we're going to let the, let the kids talk about uh, what they've learned over the last couple of weeks. And I think they have some pretty interesting ideas that they want to share with you as well. Great. Welcome. Good to see you all again. I had the opportunity to meet with this awesome group of students a couple weeks ago. All right, good morning. Uh, we are Grand Rapids Whitewater summer, summer Science Team. I'm Anna. I'm Zach. I'm Vian. I'm Lauren. I'm Nula. I'm Josh. I'm Kian. I'm Ainsley. And I'm Case. So this summer, we have had the amazing opportunity to really get to understand the Grand Rapids Whitewater River Restoration Project. And by doing that, we also got to meet important leaders along the way. On day one, we realized that we were all here because of a river, and we were all passionate about the environment. And what we did not realize is how complex this project was and how much time and effort that goes into it. But we were grateful that the city has put a lot of effort into it and contributed, and that kind of inspired us as a younger generation to see how we could get involved and what we could do for the future. We have met uh, multiple important leaders in our co community, and we would like to share what we have learned. Early on, our group learned about Grand River watersheds. We were able to use watershed modeling to find our personal watersheds. Then we tracked the path rain would follow in our watershed. We collected and identified freshwater mussels in the river. One morning, we met a Grand Valley research team working on the Grand River near the museum. We were able to help measure and mark fish. Lauren held a fish for the very first time. Ron Yab took us on a small tour uh, downtown while passing on the oral tradition of the history and culture of the Anishinaabe Native Americans. The numerous bands uh, spanning the entire river have always been a very important uh, part of the Grand River, even today. We also had the opportunity to meet with people at Founders and learn how do they make changes to better their business. They made these changes because it was good for the environment and it was the right thing to do, rather than just making cosmetic changes for publicity and to better their reputation. It was really inspiring to see a local business who was so invested in giving back to their community and reducing their carbon footprint. We learned and explored how places like the Art Museum and the Public Museum are not just collections of the past, but rather how they are active participants in the community. We gained an understanding of different ways such places can connect with nature and the community, becoming spaces for everyone to enjoy. During the past two weeks, we had the chance to enjoy the river every single day, from wading in it to walking the banks to paddling it, and we were hoping that this Whitewater Project will make this experience even better than it already is. Throughout this two-week journey, we've met lots of people. 
We spent time learning about their backgrounds and what makes them good at their job. It was interesting to find out that the majority didn't end up doing what they initially planned for their future. It was a journey. That's a lesson I will definitely carry with me from now on. Too often, the voice of our generation is overlooked. Through this program, we've met with many leaders that have provided us with the stepping stones we needed to come up with our own ideas that will allow us to voice our thoughts. While we hold small power as of right now, one day we will be the leaders in charge. And we know that having a strong involvement today, before changes are made, will allow us to secure the future. Uh, at the close of our two-week program, we learned very much from the community involved with the, with the city to the environmental factors to our city's past. We've learned why it's important to preserve the river for our city and the future of our city. To see a better, cleaner river, we have to look at the species within, like the important mussels, uh, like the endangered snuff, snuff fox mussel that we researched earlier in our study. Throughout this program, the community was a strong motif. We saw how the river brought people together, like during Art Prize, as well as some of the things that we could change to make the river more appealing and accessible for all, like with parks. Another one is history and the special connection and relationship between the Native Americans to the river. The river restoration project will have a big impact on our city economically and be of incredible value. So we have come up with a number of ideas which we like to call catalyst ideas which are big things that we have kind of in, that we hope to inspire you and to carry on for the future of this project. So we had the idea to create a new park at the heart of Grand Rapids. We were inspired by the idea of state parks across Michigan to establish the Rifford Corridor as a kind of park. Uh, this park would celebrate the restoration of the rapids in the Grand River. It would feature a youth community center that provides space for field trips and for community involvement. It would also include a Native American outdoor exhibit or museum that shares the stories that are often untold this would give our city an opportunity to learn about Anishinaabe culture, highlighting visual exhibits and traditional music. Our parks would also include forests and natural floodplains to promote, to promote a more sustainable ecosystem. Our park would also be on, the bo on both the east and west sides of the city to promote unity. Sometimes we learn by playing, creating an interactive learning playground experience for the kids even younger than we are. Playing can be a great experience that will teach the children about the ecosystem and the animals that live inside of it. A play area can include elements like... Such as a sturgeon spring, a snuffbox shaped slide, a play area for a sandbox where all the kids and the parents alike can dig up native shells, a display case in which you can see the shells and different mussels that are native to our river, as well as there being a pond for um, a man-built pond where you can look at some of the native fish in the river. We are very excited to present this idea to you because we feel like it would connect the younger generation to science and give them a sense of place. And by having hands-on learning, it um, teaches the children and people of all ages about native species as well as the river. Business, growth, and investment is a major part of the project too. We started dreaming up ways to get local businesses involved. Um, we've seen various forms of sponsorships, and we were thinking that maybe companies could sponsor Rapids. Imagine Merrill Melee, Wolverine Wipeout, Founders Flush, Van Andel Vortex, and Meyer Mayhem. Along the River Corridor, donors could sponsor engraved bricks for walkways, which would allow the public an opportunity to contribute. Beyond fundraising, like other teams, we also want the river to be a place that brings people together and gets them in touch with the river itself. One idea was to create um, a clear removable dock which would allow a new view of the river and the organisms within it, as well as new opportunities to fish off of it. We hope that through these ideas, the community would be brought together and we can foster investment in a healthier river. So through this program, we have all come to realize how important the Grand is to our city. 
uh, going in, we were all very unaware of the many layers of the Grand River, Pro uh, Grand River Wa Whitewater Project. Now we are quite interested in continuing our work with this project. Uh, one big idea that we came up with was to start a youth branch of Grand Rapids Whitewater. Um, this team would be spearheaded by this group of people you see in front of you, and um, we would invite other teens to join us, involving themselves in the community and coming up with more fresh and exciting ideas, as well as maybe joining in on the discussion of Grand Rapids Whitewater. Um, we want to be a part of a more sustainable future. Thank you for listening. All right, I'll turn to my colleagues. Colleagues, any uh, questions or comments? Commissioner? Great presentation. Um, good job, everyone. Thanks so much for being here and sharing um, what you've learned. Yes, thank you, and we appreciate your vision, too. I like some of those ideas. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you so much. It's good to see you. We wish we could join you today, but uh, we will be interviewing third ward candidates from four to seven today so we won't be able to join you um, but we hope it's a great success and we're so excited about not just everything you learned but the recommendations as well so nice work yeah. all right commissioners next that will take us to another presentation uh, and this is a presentation of our pre-audit plan for our fiscal year that ended on june 30th and we'll kick this off with gianna wallace uh, so, Jana, maybe 10, 15 minutes? Um, probably less than that, unless oh, okay. you have a lot of questions. Okay, great. Okay. So, commissioners, you probably know we do this every year. Uh, so, you, some of you have heard this before, although obviously different information. Right. Uh, so. so, this year uh, is the first time we've had Plant Moran. As you'll recall, City Commission approved Plant Moran as a city's auditor in November 2017. Um, uh, national professional auditing standards <coughs> require that the auditors come and speak to you as a governing body for the City of Grand Rapids. Uh, today we have three members of staff from uh, Plant Moran, uh, Bill Brickley, Bricky, uh, Marie Stego, and Joe Kozlowski. And Bill's going to kick things off, and then Marie will uh, touch base on some of the points in the cover letter, and then afterwards uh, we'll answer any questions that you might have. Great. Thank, Thank you, you, Jana. Thank you, Jana, and good morning. Good morning. I, I'll tell you, that's a tough act to follow there. Hopefully the, <laughs> the audit... Good pictures the, and... You, right, exactly. <laughs> Uh, we'll do our best to keep it somewhat entertaining, though. Uh, so as mentioned, I'm Bill Bricky with Plant Moran, one of the audit partners on your account. Also with me is Joe Kowalski. Joe will be one of the uh, co-partners with me. And then Marie Stiegel will be the manager, uh, kind of handling the day-to-day -day activities uh, of the audit. So, so as mentioned, we're here to talk about the audit for the year ended uh, June 30, 2018. We have started our preliminary work, but we will primarily start um, our field work in September. September 10th will be our first day in the field, kind of here doing the, the heavy lifting, if you will. So the primary re reason we're meeting with you today is to discuss our audit plan, but ultimately is to open up the lines of communication between uh, us and you as your position uh, as commissioners. Our ultimate goal today is really just to kind of you know, let you know what our audit plan is, and if there's any risks or issues that you have, we provided our contact information in the letter. So if you, if you let us know in the next month or so, we can make sure and incorporate any concerns you have into our audit plan uh, before we actually start the process. So what you have in your packet today is we do have a formal letter that we provided, and this covers a lot of the required information that, that we have to report to you. Uh, but again, our ultimate goal today is just to let you know what our plan is, and if there's any um, you know, issues you have, let us know. We, we can certainly address those. Uh, but, but ultimately our goal is just to you know, provide transparency and so that there's no, uh, no surprises come the end, of the end of the audit. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Marie and she's going to go over the letter that we provided at a pretty high level. And again, if there's any questions at all, please just let us know. Good morning. Good so morning. as Bill mentioned, I will highlight the key points of the formal letter that you've received in your packet. Um, first, the letter does explain what our responsibility is as your auditor. So as part of our audit, we will be providing an opinion on the financial statements prepared by management as to whether those financial statements are um, free of material misstatement. You will see, um, we will also communicate to you whether we identify any non-compliance with laws, regulation, contracts, or grants as part of our audit. 
Within our audit opinion this year, you will see an emphasis paragraph that will just alert you to the fact that a new accounting standard is required to be implemented for this fiscal year. Um, it's called GASB 75, but really it's just a new accounting standard as to the way the liability for retiree health care is recorded. And so we've been working um, in conjunction with management to implement that new standard, and you'll see that in your financial statements this coming year. We do split our audit process into three stages. So the first is the planning and information gathering stage. And this has really been um, ongoing since we were hired as your auditor, but especially in the past couple months. Then internally, we go through our risk assessment phase as we get ready for the audit field work, which occurs in September largely. I do want to alert you to the concept of what's called a group audit that's explained in our letter. Um, really what this means is as your auditor we're responsible for the audit of all funds within the city's financial statements except for two that are audited by another audit firm which are the general retirement system and the police and fire retirement system. So combined that'll be a group audit. We'll have communication with them as part of the audit process and refer to that other auditors report in our opinion letter. During our planning phase of the audit, we do identify whether there's any significant risk that we need to build into our audit plan. Um, we look at industry considerations, you know, quantitatively large items, um, items that require some level of estimation or other factors to identify those risks. So the ones that we have identified are laid out in the formal letter that you have, as well as what our response to those risks will be. So we've established procedures such as detailed analytics, recalculations, and testing um, to address those risks that we've identified. As part of our audit, we do obtain an understanding of internal controls at the city. We do this by getting questionnaires that are filled out by management and then doing walkthroughs of those processes and key internal controls. Um, any audit, it doesn't provide an opinion on internal controls, but if there are any weaknesses that we identify in the internal controls, those would be communicated to you um, at the end of our audit process. There is a concept of materiality that's inherent in an auditor's work, so we're not looking at every single transaction that's going through the city. Um, we do place greater emphasis on items that would be more important to the financial statements and addressing whether there's any material errors. So that does involve you know, such things as sampling techniques to, to test items. Um, with that, as Bill mentioned, you know, we welcome any questions or concerns that you would like to um, to discuss with us. Our contact information is in the formal letter that you received. And if there are any questions that we can answer now, we'd be happy to do that. Great, thank you. Commissioners, any questions? Pretty straightforward? Mm -hmm. All right, okay. thank, thank you. you. Okay. Appreciate Thanks. your work, thanks. All right, commissioners, that will take us to our um, next item, which is an action item. So this is a resolution approving a request for myself and Commissioner Kelly, Commissioner Rapart, and Commissioner Lanier to attend the MML conference. Can I get a motion? Support. All right, um, Commissioner O'Connor Jones, uh, did you want to attend? It's here yeah. in Grand Rapids, so the approval is just for the registration because yep. obviously we yeah. won't need to travel. Uh -huh. <laughs> are, you, are you both um, planning to attend? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So. Um, I will add then Commissioner Jones and Commissioner O'Connor to this, yeah. uh, and uh, we'll get those registrations in after this is voted on today. A couple points about the uh, convention that we're hosting here in Grand Rapids. Um, it's a great lineup. Uh, it's, it's going to be a joint meeting of Michigan Municipal League and the Michigan um, Planning Association, so it's going to be a significant crowd, probably well over a thousand people throughout our state, both from planning and from other municipalities. We're doing a joint reception um, and welcome reception uh, over at the downtown market, so hopefully all of you will be able to attend that. Um, and then they have a really good lineup. Um, one of my favorites they're bringing in is Bruce Katz. Uh, so he's an author and is, writes a lot for Brookings Institute, so hopefully you'll be able to hear him speak as well. So we'll get the registration uh, after today, and then you'll get um, information and you can sign up for the workshops as well. Very good. All right, so with that, I'll, do I need an amendment? Clarifying. Yes. Okay, so can I get an amendment to add um, Commissioner Jones and O'Connor for the approval? So moved. Support. All those in favor say aye. 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 
And then, so um, I'll call another question for all of us to attend. Uh, what are we? Thank you. All right. All those in favor, say aye. Aye. Those opposed? It carries. All right. And I'll ask um, Laura to go ahead and register all of us and then get that to you. Sounds good. Okay, so next is a resolution scheduling a special meeting with the City Commission to be held on July 35th, 31st at 8 a.m. here in these chambers. Support. All right. So commissioners, our intent is to uh, meet next week to cast a vote uh, for Third Ward Commission. Uh, although uh, I have heard that if we feel compelled, we can also do that tonight um, at our meeting. So if we feel like we're ready to make a decision, um, we can always take that up after the public hearing tonight uh, at the end of our meeting. So that I'll, I'll kind of let you all decide. Um, we initially decided maybe we should have a week in between if we needed more time to think. A couple commissioners felt like they may be able to make a decision tonight. If that's the case, we can um, do a, a walk-on resolution. Okay. So just an FYI, but let's, I'm going to go ahead and uh, make the motion to meet next week just so that we have a special meeting scheduled and then we can always decide to cancel it if we wish. So, do I have a support? Okay, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed? It carries. All right, next is a resolution scheduling a work session of the City Commission for July 24th. This will be from 12.30 to 2. Oh, that's not accurate. Reschedule. Oh, rescheduling. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> rescheduling from today to August 14th from 1.30 to 3 here in the chambers. And this is to um, discuss street lighting. So moved. Support. support. All right, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed? It carries. So that, that will be posted. It's going to happen. It's official. Thank you. Um, no conflicts. Well, yes. Um, and then the next one is also scheduling a special meeting for uh, July 31st at 2 o'clock and another one on August 7th um, at 8.30 here in the chambers. And this is for city manager interviews. Support. Support. All right, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed? It carries. All right, we're adding lots of meetings to our schedule. Um, and commissioners, we uh, we also have the public safety work session on our schedule, so all of you should have that on your schedule as well. That will be a three-hour work session focused on public safety. Um, I know that it was uh, the interim city manager sent out an email with topics. If you have any additional topics you would like included in that agenda, please um, send those in this week so we can finalize that, have the information available, and the appropriate staff um, who can attend that. Okay, Commissioner? Yeah, I just want to make sure that, and, I, and Tom, you can probably answer this, that the questions that we have are also given to the Chief of Police because clearly oh, yes. he's going to want to be able to prepare and know <clears throat> what, we're, what we want to better understand. Yes, agreed. Agreed. Yeah, Commissioner, are you asking about when that is? Yeah, and, okay, so just to make sure I'm on the right page, you weren't saying that the meeting, the public safety was the 7th, were you? No, so okay. on the 7th. Oh, it is. It is. It is, it is the 7th. It is. It's in the afternoon. The day. Okay. So in the morning on the 7th, we will, um, we will do any additional interviews and have a discussion about city manager, and then in the afternoon from 2 to 5 is our public safety work session. So even though August 7th is an off Tuesday, we'll be busy oh. at work. We don't have many off Tuesdays lately. We don't. So, uh, so yes, same day. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. All right, and I already called the question on that. Yeah. All right, so next we have a resolution authorizing certain special events subject to Chapter 53 of the City Code. Support. Support. All right. Ms. Yvette, you want to tell us about this? Absolutely. So these are events that will be occurring in August. We have about 65 events, weddings, and equipment rentals in August. So we're very excited. Very busy summer for our office and for the city, and we love that. Um, I'm especially excited about August 7th, which is uh, National Night Out. And we have quite a few of those that um, we are planning for. And it's also primary election day. Yay. Yeah. <laughs> and a work session yeah. and a city manager decision. <laughs> it's going to be a fun day. Yeah. Yes. All right, commissioners, any questions about events? All right. All right. Um, and I know there's a list of National Night Out events. Um, make sure if you're interested in attending those, you just get those from event. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, um, Mayor, yeah. Yvette, if you could just send those to us, that would be great because yeah. absolutely yeah, yes. handy. Thank Plan you. Our route. Thank you. <laughs> yes. All right. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. <laughs> those opposed? It carries. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. 
<laughs> All right, next we have a resolution providing for publication and setting a date for consideration of a proposed ordinance amendment to the recreational fire ordinance. So moved. All right. All Mr. right. Canfield. Yes. Good morning, Mayor and Commissioners. So this is a topic we've kept off your agenda for 18 months, but time is up. It's back. So um, the, uh, the recreational uh, fire ordinance was adopted in September of 2016, August of 2016. So it went into effect in September of 2016, and it's a two-year pilot program, which we are recommending you extend by six months so that we can consider next steps in terms of uh, would you like to continue it? Are there modifications that you are desiring at a, at a different time when there's less on the agenda? <laughs> yes. So nice of you. Yeah. <laughs> and I do want to recognize Shante Rogers, who's the person who makes the program work uh, from uh, day to day. And then, of course, Rick Doctor uh, is, is responsible for dealing with the complaints. Great. Thank you both for being here. Um, speaking of that, I have a, I have a question. Uh, can you fill us in on uh, on complaints? Are we getting significant complaints? Has the program been relatively smooth? Can you just kind of fill us in on how it's going? I think some of us have heard from residents, but it'd be nice to have kind of a more global perspective. Certainly, uh, Mayor, thanks for having You're me welcome. here this morning. Um, so I, I do have our numbers for this year. Overall, uh, we're seeing fewer complaints. Uh, we've had 78 uh, complaints this year. And uh, of those, uh, 38 have been, uh, we found out that people are, are not burning the proper thing, uh, 78 that have not had permits. But we've only uh, uh, written three civil infractions in that time because what we're doing, uh, our part is to provide education to those people who have heard that recreational fires are allowed in, in Grand Rapids. Uh, but then have not followed through with the permit process. So we educate them on the permit process and on, uh, on the correct way to do that. Uh, yeah, and uh, then we get some complaints uh, from people or, or uh, that do not do it while the person is burning. Uh, and they, won't, they have different complaints and say they're neighbors. So for those people, we provide education through a letter. And, uh, and we've also had very good results from that. Thank you. I have a couple questions, Mayor. Yep, go ahead, Commissioner. So do we know how many um, have, how many permits there are? We know about complaints now, but. I believe that. It says 60 in the. Okay, 60. 60 that are currently issued. There have been more issued in the past, and they're not all, you know, in force. Some were not renewed. Okay. So we do have a. 80% issue rate, so as you're aware, a neighbor may object, and if they object, if someone who's required to be notified objects, then we cannot issue a permit, and so roughly 20% do not get issued. <clears throat> and then, Lou, is there any um, way we can determine the effect on our air quality? Because I remember when we passed this, uh, there was uh, information published in the newspaper about there had just been a report about air quality and that we were just over um, the recommended levels of various pollutants and so are we, are we checking that at all? So we're not. I don't know if there's an enforcement way to check such things in terms of like smoke impacts but it's such a small number of fires mm -hmm. that burn inter intermittently yeah, yeah. that it would be a, a tough thing to study. Well we did learn that we're in CD this morning that we may that we're installing equipment that may eventually give us that more granular information okay. so hopefully we can use that in the future someone started burning next to me so I oh. you know I know what that's like <laughs> <laughs> personally are you testing the air quality <laughs> I don't have the equipment for that so. <laughs> All right, commissioners, any other questions? So the question before us today is to provide a six-month extension, and then we'll revisit this in six months. Great idea. Yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, it carries. Nay. I'm opposed. All right, one nay. So five yays, one nay. All right. So that'll be off consent tonight. All right, next that will take us to a discussion of zoning ordinance text amendments relative to the sale of alcohol for off-premise consumption. 
Can I get a motion? Oh, well, it's a discussion. Yeah. All right, scratch that. Yeah. Uh, Suzanne Schultz, you want to tell us about this? Good morning, Mayor and Commissioners. Good morning. And as president of the MAP board this year, I do encourage you to to the conference because it will be great. And uh, our staff is working really, really hard on the mobile tours. So if you want to see the city in a different way, you can actually uh, partake in some of the mobile tours that we're going to be holding. So it should be a great event. Uh, for, the, for the discussion about alcohol, we have been at this for some time. Uh, on June 5th, the commission postponed to today uh, to discuss the alcohol amendments, and that provided the Chamber of Commerce, along with their constituents, time to have additional discussions around the proposed ordinance, and I believe there had been also discussions with some members of the commission. Uh, given um, that the, the period now for gas stations to uh, apply for alcohol requests has basically ended, uh, we had 20 requests, all of which were approved by the Planning Commission for SDM, which is allows for beer and wine. Uh, in, those, in those gas stations, <clears throat> the, the concern about the urgency of this matter is somewhat <coughs> diminished. Uh, although I do want to mention that the MLCC did repeal their half mile rule and there has been no legislative action to instate that as law. So that is still out there. Uh, and that would be for liquor stores, the SDD licenses. Um, the chamber uh, provided a letter that described a uh, desire for several things to happen uh, around uh, alcohol-related businesses. One is improving communication. Uh, second is enhancing code enforcement of existing ordinances, particularly looking at lighting, landscape ma maintenance, littering, signage, and transparency for windows, and looking at subtype. In our discussions with the chamber and evaluating and also understanding how enforcement is occurring in the city currently, um, with our practices, for example, we have the police department, they will review an alcohol outlet for SEPTED on the inside and the shelving and the direction of where the cash register is located. Uh, we have sign inspector staff that they look at signs uh, and it's more, because we're more complaint based, it's whether or not we have complaints, although we do encourage more proactive enforcement for signs. Uh, and then code compliance regulates the rest of the zoning and nuisance portion. So if someone has taken their coolers and put them all up against the windows, like we have uh, with Miss Tracy's, for example, on Franklin, um, and that's an ongoing enforcement issue, um, that um, then that's a code compliance issue. So uh, we have kind of a disjointed approach right now. And one of the difficulties we have with zoning is that people have non-conforming rights. So if there was something that was legal uh, or in practice before the zoning was amended, a property owner can still continue that practice. So if there are signs fully covering the windows, and it's always been that way for the past 40 years at this party store, we have to honor that. The benefit of looking at this in a different way with a SEPTED ordinance, and I have it described in, in the memo, very rarely see environment, both for the employees, but for the community as well. And so what we're recommending uh, is that we actually um, pull back, withdraw the proposed ordinance, unless the commission feels strongly that you want to discuss uh, separation distances and other things related to alcohol. It's still a special land use uh, with the planning commission, no matter what. Uh, so we had been looking at, particularly around the gas station issue, number of cooler doors, amount of square footage of the space, to make sure it was an ancillary use, not the primary use, that we didn't have a store going from selling um, gas to becoming completely a, a beer or wine store that happens to sell gas. Uh, so we, we wanted to control that. The Planning Commission was very good at trying to limit the number of cooler doors and square footage. We can continue that practice without having to legislate that in the ordinance unless the commission feels otherwise. So um, the recommendation from staff is to withdraw the proposed language and we will proceed with working on a SEPTED ordinance with the police department and uh, code compliance and any other city departments that would be affected to develop um, both a draft ordinance as well as an education and awareness program so that we are working with business owners to build that awareness and understanding for why these are important regulations as well as an enforcement strategy to figure out okay, from a staffing and resource standpoint how we can be more proactive and do this better. Great. Um, Commissioner O'Connor. Yeah, I just want to say that I'm very supportive of that uh, endeavor. I think that's a great idea and it uh, will have not, you know, not just alcohol but a lot of other uses that we're concerned about. I think this is a much uh, a very forward way of thinking about this, and so I'm really supportive of you continuing that work and 
-hmm. wasn't willing to, I don't know, do we need a motion to withdraw this since it's a, just a discussion or no? I think we, I don't think we do. I think we need to give um, Suzanne direction. Okay. Um, this has kind of been out there for a while. I know we've heard from a, a lot of community members uh, and I think similar to what Suzanne heard, many of us heard the, the real core yeah. issue is enforcement yeah. and how do we really take a close look at those individuals who are where there's significant problems. Mm -hmm. uh, so, Commissioner Lanier, did you have some comments? I did. Um, thank you so much, Suzanne, for that overview. Can you help me to understand how the gas station, um, the, what brought this to our attention was that so many gas stations were requesting license. And so can you help me to understand how that's no longer an issue? Did Was there like an expiration of how quickly they were able to obtain those licenses? Do we have coffee? Yeah. yeah, the so the state law changed. The state legislature decided to allow gas stations the ability to sell beer and wine. And then they opened up a period of time that they could apply for those licenses. So that's why we had several planning commission agendas just full of beer and wine requests from gas stations. So um, as I mentioned, we had 20 of them, basically almost all gas stations mm -hmm. um, went through that process. So, so what's going to prevent that from happening again? So that, because what happened when that occurred, then we were kind of scrambling to, to try to react to that. And the moratorium happened and it was reversed. So I'm just trying to proactively think through if the state of Michigan decides to open this up again, you know, it, are there provisions that we can put in place to try and make sure that we're ahead of this as opposed to reacting to it? <coughs> I think one of the difficulties with the state legislature is how they operate, and when they change things, uh, sometimes there's not a lot of notice given. Car and Fire Act certainly working in Lansing has been able to help us better anticipate when issues like this arise, but um, we don't always know where it's coming from. We may have a dormant bill that's been sitting there for a while, and all of a sudden it pops on a committee agenda on a late Friday, and it's on the committee on Tuesday, and they put it on the floor on Wednesday. Uh, we've had that happen. So I think it's one of those things that we have to be nimble to be able to react to. Okay. So then my second question is um, tied to the SEPTEC. So I'm wondering if there is a way to bring in some of the neighborhood groups that um, mm -hmm. had concern, again, that brought this to our attention before. So as you're having some discussions with the Chamber and the Planning Commission and some of the business um, members from the business community, if you could also bring in the neighborhood leaders who were quite vocal about um, being in opposition of some of the language that we were considering, I think that'll be helpful for us to come up with some good standard language that I think everyone will embrace. I think that's a great suggestion. Yeah. Thank you, Commissioner. I was thinking the same thing. So for the SEPTED ordinance, I, I do think some of those proactive meetings would be helpful um, before that language is finalized. And then, um, Suzanne, can, can I also ask you to maybe connect with Karen? Um, and, and set up a meeting with the liquor control because part of this and part of what we've heard is people um, are extremely frustrated when there are complaints and we don't have any input uh, and, and the liquor control isn't holding people accountable and they're the ones that actually can, are the only ones that can, that can uh, take away a license once it's been, once it, once it's been given. Uh, so I think we need to do um, some work developing a relationship so that we can have conversations. If through this ordinance we find that we do have um, some repeat offenders, we're going to need a partnership with the state to really address those issues. Okay, so great. Yes. Yeah. Commissioner? I could not agree more because I'm sure you remember some a couple of locations in the second ward when we worked together yes. that were real problematic and I even went to Lansing yeah. once, but we really need to establish a relationship with the state. Um, I, I'm really in support of, of this uh, because of the, the upcoming conversations around marijuana and the very like, the likelihood that this is going to pass in the fall, in November, for recreational. So I just, uh, I think that having someone looking at enforcement for both of those are, is just going to be so important and so helpful, particularly around our concerns around minors, um, if recreational passes because of the um, the ability to buy um, marijuana in the form of edibles. So anything we can do to also have that conversation and bring it up with the neighborhood groups and educate because we are, you know, we want to make sure that we protect our, our kids. Yeah, and um, we have prepared, um, Kristen Rewa is here to address, I know when it comes up in the marijuana discussion, there's been 
issues raised, and uh, and she's ready to discuss that with you. Good. Yeah. Thank you. So Suzanne, can you give us a sense of uh, when this ordinance will uh, come back to us? So our goal is by for the end of the year, okay. so that um, we before we get into budget discussions, that you know from a staffing resources standpoint what would be required in kind of a reallocation. I'm not suggesting that we need new staff. I don't know yet um, that there might just be a shift in, in responsibilities and how we reallocate. So uh, we have to go through that process, but we would want to have that so you would know kind of going into budget where we're headed with it. But I'm not, yeah. And last time you talked about this, though, didn't you, and maybe it was even th in during the budget discussions, you had indicated that you thought there could be a realignment of current resources or staffing? Yes. Um, OK. okay. Yep. That's, that's my goal, is to, is to do that. Uh, it is possible, if we combine it with marijuana enforcement, that there is revenue that would come from that, from the, the permit fee piece, uh, that we could be able to leverage towards that. So I think we just have to work out what that looks like. I do envision a realignment of staff in some form or fashion. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, so so in regards to this, I, I, I believe it's on our evening agenda as well. I think I'd like to pull it from that. I don't necessarily feel the need to talk about this again tonight. Uh, and does this give you clear direction on, on what we hope happens next? Yeah, I'm excited to see what the outcomes will be because I think that this does look at it in a different way and uh, hopefully it will produce better outcomes for what we want. Okay. All right. All right. Thank you, commissioners, for a good discussion and good direction for Suzanne. All right. Next, that will take us to a resolution, um, adoption of a zoning ordinance, text amendments to allow marijuana facilities. Can I get a motion? Uh, Mayor, I move to uh, adopt the planning commission recommendations around medical marijuana uh, with the understanding that we're going to talk about some thoughtful changes in response to community concerns. Okay. Do I have a support? second? Do yeah. I have a support? So the planning commission recommendations are on the table for discussion. All right, so why don't we start with Suzanne. <laughs> um, so Suzanne, you have been uh, in this, uh, I, don't, I would say knee deep, but I think it's probably deeper than that. Um, you had countless community meetings and conversations. Uh, we, why don't you walk through a little bit about what has brought us here today and what we are going to be discussing. I know you also, uh, in light of a number of conversations you had, you came forward and shared with us a potential hybrid approach. Yes. So maybe you can touch on that as well. Yes, I'll, I'll uh, do that. <laughs> Thank you, Commissioner O'Connor, for throwing that in there. I'm like, what do I do with that? Uh, the, um, but I'll, I'll cover both the planning director, because I know you, I'll just give you background, and then I'm assuming you'll have your discussion. So uh, as was mentioned, we've had a lot of community outreach. We have a website that's up. Um, we have a compendium that was created with lots of data in it. There's a story map. Uh, we had community meetings. We've had the public hearing with the Planning Commission as well as the City Commission. This is one um, map from the story map that shows the number of potentially sensitive uses. Uh, and it's a very busy map. And we use that information from uh, the state of Michigan as well as uh, other sources to identify parks and schools and playgrounds. and churches and rehabilitation centers and other potentially sensitive uses and laid that on a map. When uh, the planning department looked at other potential regulatory approaches, we, we looked uh, both within the state of Michigan as well as outside to see how other communities regulate. Uh, we debated between a quota system versus a separation distance to try to manage the concentration of uses. That is a common thread that we had with the Planning Commission. They also felt that it was important to keep separation distances between facilities so that we didn't have an overabundance of one particular use uh, in our districts. The Planning Department recommendation identified schools, child care centers, parks, rehab centers, municipal borders, and um, all at 1,000 feet from a buffer standpoint and 250 feet from a residential area. Uh, what that provided us when we applied those buffers is 208 potential parcels where you could have a marijuana facility. If we apply that 600 foot separation distance between facilities as proposed, that would give you 41 potential facility locations. 
In that, uh, we allow for co-location of facilities. So you could have a grow facility processing and marijuana uh, provisioning center all in the same location. So that when I say 41, that doesn't necessarily mean that um, you're limited to 41 businesses per se. It would be potential locations. This, uh, that 41 is the highest number that you would anticipate. Certainly it's dependent upon land availability uh, and also where other facilities locate beforehand. You may have some, if it's not optimum spacing, knocking each other, look, knocking each other out. The Planning Commission came back and reviewed it and suggested that for provisioning centers, the buffers for schools, child care centers, and parks be maintained and a thousand foot separation between uses occur, which pro would provide up to um, 143 facility locations once that separation distance is applied. Uh, and then for other marijuana facilities, they eliminated parks and had schools and child care centers in a 600 foot separation distance for maximum number of business locations of 293. We heard um, a number of public comments and based on planning department research, uh, there, there's been a lot of talk about this in the upsides and downsides, uh, kind of a polarity management exercise and how we think about what we want to do with marijuana regulation. From the planning department perspective, we have, uh, our goal was to manage gradual change take a relatively low risk approach, something that was administratively feasible. We have heard stories, for example, Ann Arbor, when they first initiated all the potential locations, they had people camping out for four days uh, to be able to sit, submit their application. So uh, when it's so wide open, we would expect a huge number of applications coming in uh, and uh, we're already getting multiple requests. Our phones are constantly ringing. Um, with interest from both Michigan as well as other states uh, regarding this ordinance. Uh, we also view, took the view that so we have the ability to amend the ordinance and learn from our successes and failures, so kind of that gradual change approach. The downside that you heard in the public comment period was that um, there was too few locations, that there was a low opportunity for small business startups, uh, and that there was a possibility for congestion and parking issues given that if we look at the eight county area surrounding Grand Rapids of 1.3 million people, we were really one of the only communities that would be allowing provisioning centers within this region, uh, which is not necessarily completely our issue to service everybody's marijuana needs, but we have to acknowledge that there will be an impact if we have too few, I, I'm concerned about. Um, the, the challenge, too, in this approach also favors large players in industry. I would also argue, though, that the Planning Commission um, approach does as well, that uh, I have compared this to starting everyone at the same starting line um, and saying, ready, set, go, whether it's a small business or it's a large business, that um, there, there's, it, the challenge here is that there is so much money in this business um, that uh, it's definitely attracted very large investors. <coughs> One of the uh, issues we've cited from a staff standpoint is planning commission recommendation. It does provide for that large number of locations, which has been desired by advocates. Um, but then it also, with opening up those more sites, it would be more administratively difficult to, to manage. Um, and in some cases, higher risk if we're trying to manage change. But it would provide, if we have more locations, there could be potential for more sm small startups. Um, and it would disperse the use impact because you'd have more locations. Um, so trying to figure out how do we take the best of both uh, and move forward was the approach when I was trying to figure out how to take the public comment and take the planning or take the city commission's concerns and acknowledge this but try to do this uh, in a different way. And so um, I know this is very busy to read, but the hybrid approach, which is um, up for your consideration. I'm certainly, as Commissioner O'Connor mentioned, he prefers the Planning Commission recommendation. That's one alternative. The Planning Director, uh, the initial Planning Department recommendation is another alternative. A third alternative is a hybrid that tries to achieve uh, the, the upsides of both. That would be that in the hybrid recommendation, we would take into consideration um, the MRTMA um, language that's proposed for November, the recreational ballot language, which allows for a six category of uh, facilities. That is for micro businesses. And the micro businesses are really described as similar to a micro distillery or micro brewery 
the city or the city, the, the state of California recently adopted micro business rules, and there's articles out there that I can certainly share regarding um, wineries viewing this as a new opportunity, you know, business owners viewing as this is a new opportunity um, for them in, in a micro business setting rather than trying to compete with larger industries. So the requirements for a micro business is they cannot cultivate more than 150 plants. They're responsible for growing, processing, and selling their own products. So if you think of a microbrewery, uh, they, they can only sell the beer that they're producing. They can't bring in others. Um, and the, the state, uh, in, the, in the proposed law, LARA can only issue licenses to Michigan residents for the first two years. And then it would be opened up. Uh, but then uh, ownership can not be in a micro business in any other type of license type and it's only allowed in one micro business. So I think what you see, and in the recreational language, it would allow for over time Lara to expand licensing opportunities, whether that's for distribution or growth in that industry. Uh, currently, it's, this is the way it's written, but it, the law does provide for expansion of that. Lara can allow for different license types. To me, the upside would be that it manages this change more gradually because there is some timing um, components to this with this being adopted in November uh, then Lara has a year to adopt their rules although we could start providing land use approvals prior to then and so I have a timeline to show you that uh, we would recommend uh, again we can we have the ability to amend ordinance uh, ordinances for successes, successes and failures uh, this would provide those locations for small business and startups where they're not competing with large industry, that they have a niche uh, in our neighborhood business areas uh, with that thousand foot separation that's unique and separate from other marijuana type facilities. Um, and it would allow for some business planning um, that because of that lead time. So using that hybrid approach, if we took the planning director recommendation and the micro business approach, which would follow the planning commission's recommendation except for including the 1,000 foot buffer from adjacent municipalities. We would end up with 1,253 parcels for potential locations um, and 98 potential sites. And uh, this is how it shows in, in relation to potential locations within the business areas. Uh, the map on the right that has the table to it shows areas of gray that are outside of the SID districts, but there had been a question about how many might that affect within the corridor improvement districts. Again, that's with optimum spacing, so it could be less, um, but it would allow for some facilities um, dispersed throughout the city but this would be different for the micro businesses than it would be for the larger facilities. Uh, this is just a summary table that shows uh, the department recommendation of 208 parcels or 41 potential locations, planning commission uh, 2,600 parcels, uh, 143 potential locations for dispensaries or 293 potential locations for other marijuana facilities or the hybrid approach of roughly 1,200 parcels in 98 potential locations. Uh, from a timeline standpoint, uh, I want you to understand that this is one piece of this puzzle. So we have the zoning recommendations which set the framework for us to be able to determine the rest of our approaches. So if we're talking about a veto, you would need to update your veto policy. The city commission would be approving the vetoes per your policy, and I've already had conversations with Jessica Wood regarding this. So you have the opportunity to define your desired outcomes that you would want from an equity perspective and how that would reflect in the veto in agreements with marijuana business owners. You also have the opportunity to decide how you want to expend marijuana revenue. Uh, there is a formula in the current um, MMFLA. It is different in the MRTMA, but either one has a formula that gives money back to the city. Um, and in other places like Portland, Oregon, they've invested in job training. They've looked at the equity considerations around persons of color who've been disproportionately affected by marijuana laws in the past and enforcement. Uh, so there are other opportunities to discuss that, and I would strongly urge you to engage the county in that discussion because they will be receiving the equivalent or more of those receipts um, <coughs> from businesses doing, doing uh, transactions within the city of Grand Rapids. 
So from a timeline standpoint, this was self, the framework, the current zoning ordinance piece. I would encourage you to identify desired equity outcomes, discuss, adopt, revise the VEDA commission policy. During that time period in, in September, October, the planning department would also meet with neighborhood and business districts to discuss what a uh, good neighbor plan in Avita was so that they're prepared to have those discussions with marijuana businesses. Um, then have you also discussed the city commission, hopefully in coordination with the county, this, the disbursement of marijuana receipts. Uh, and then what we're proposing is that we would accept uh, medical marijuana facilities applications beginning on October 1 of this year. Um, then there would be the vote in November, uh, both if the Spartan Safe GR petition is submitted and certified, as well as for the our, our MRTMA. Uh, and then we would look to accept applications for micro businesses beginning on April 1 of next year. Again, they could not open until Lara has given their licenses and Lara will still be in their rulemaking process, but we would anticipate being able to uh, supply them with preliminary land use approvals if they so desired. And that the final applications accepted for all other recreational marijuana facilities would begin on October 1, 2019. Uh, and then kind of a plan do check act cycle, we'd evaluate the ordinance amend as necessary and report on outcome measurements. So we'd also want to evaluate during this process at the very beginning what metrics we want to use to evaluate the impacts of both the policy and the industry in our community. All right, thank you. Um, Suzanne, can you also touch on uh, some of the answers to the questions that have been posed? So all of us have been receiving uh, multiple questions about, about this, uh, and we sent them all to you, and you provided some responses, <coughs> but we didn't, I, I know everything on this is fast and furious, it seems like. <laughs> yes. So can you just touch on some of these uh, and just briefly answer the questions that have been posed, just so publicly people know that we are um, taking all of the questions very seriously and we're um, working really hard to have the answers before we move forward with a decision. Yes, Thanks. and we can also post these on the website. As you know, we finished these um, late yesterday. Uh, I won't go through all 16 questions, but... Uh, number 14. Number 14. Number 14. Follow up for 14. Okay. Make sure um, okay. Yes. So uh, I'll start with we, we, this has been a common question. If we pass a proposal for medical marijuana, can we opt out of recreational? Um, if recreational is adopted, um, there's, two, there's really two important parts, I think. One is that you can opt out of marijuana in general. But if you've decided to opt in and the law says a municipality may not adopt an ordinance that prohibits a marijuana grower, processor, and a retailer from operating with a single facility or from operating at a location shared with a marijuana facility operating pursuant to the Medical Marijuana Facilities Licensing Act. So if we have approved medical marijuana facilities, you are allowed to have recreational in those facilities, the way that we read this law uh, as proposed. So that's, um, that was one question. Uh, can marijuana microbusinesses be allowed in other types of marijuana facilities? Currently, the Medical Marijuana Facilities Licensing Act does not have microbusinesses listed as a, a licensed facility, and Lara has no rules. So it's kind of one of those chicken or egg things that we can't allow microbusinesses because we don't we there, we don't have a law to point to right now. For this, the ordinance is written is anticipatory, so we are anticipating that the recreational ordinance would pass and that it would trigger, but first, as I mentioned in the timeline, the initiation of medical marijuana facilities would be allowed first. Um, if surrounding communities don't allow marijuana businesses, uh, they're, they're opting out, all of our surrounding jurisdictions. Does that mean, and yes, yeah, citizens can petition both in the facilities, but also uh, the recreational language in particular has um, suggestions on how uh, citizens can petition their own communities to opt in. So um, I don't think this is going to go away just because we do it, that the, the other communities will be facing that. Um, the the uh, Commissioner Kelly had a question about can we tie marijuana business approval to, from a SID and bid similar to what we do for alcohol. Uh, Right now, SID districts, quarter improvement districts, um, are allowed to recommend to the city commission by city commission policy whether or not a business should be granted a redevelopment liquor license. Um, it's a recommendation, and one of the things that was um, in that SID bid map I showed you, there are certainly areas outside of those districts that um, are not in SID 
sit area. So we would want to make sure from an equal treatment standpoint that we're respecting that and just seek that good neighbor plan and that input from the neighborhood and business associations and certainly have that in the public hearing phase. Um, question number 14 for Commissioner Lanier. Um, the uh, Wayne County that was my issue. I didn't understand the response, so elaborate when you get to that. Yeah, so a Wayne County Circuit judge uh, made a ruling on February 16th, that 2018, that overturned a voter-approved medical marijuana initiative. How does this apply to Grand Rapids? Um, so in, in, maybe Kristen wants to comment. You want to comment on that? Sure. I'll let you do that. How does that affect us? I think what it does is it clarifies for us attorneys, at least, in terms of what is the nature of an opt-in. Can, you know, is an opt-in ordinance wholly land use? Is it police power? Is it business? Can it be any of these? And so what Wayne County did, Detroit had, had proffered two opt-in ordinances. One was strictly zoning. One was a combination of zoning and um, a business regulation, a licensing scheme. The court said, um, citizens, you're not allowed under state law to initiate by petition zoning, but you are allowed to do a police power that's not zoning. So this affirms that at least there's one court out there. Wayne County's not binding on us, but it's a pretty well-written opinion. This affirms that there's at least one court that interprets an opt-in ordinance can be something that's other than land use. And that, I think, helps us understand really the need for us to have land use in place um, and, and the concern that we have with delay in implementing some land use um, for if and when um, our initiatives are, authorized, are, are on the ballot and passed um, in November. Does that, does that help understand? Is that okay? Yeah, thank you. Yep. Do, you. do you want Kristen to also talk about uh, youth and to Commissioner Kelly's earlier comment? Sure. Absolutely. First, I want to start out to make sure we're all on the same page of understanding what is the state of the law today in Grand Rapids as it pertains to youth and marijuana enforcement. In the wake of the decriminalized GR Charter Amendment passage, which is now Charter Amendment 292, there is no distinction in age. So what happens when an officer encounters a youth, or, or anybody, um, but particularly a youth, um, and there's marijuana on the youth, uh, will seize the marijuana, will write a, a civil infraction ticket, will attempt to call the parent, and that's it. So, um, that, so I, I guess my concern is our current structure doesn't necessarily help youth either. Um, I will tell you sort of anecdotally, our um, circuit court, uh, family court judges were actually really upset with that passage because that meant that kids were not, not pushed through any diversionary treatment through um, the juvenile court system. Um, and, and that was a problem from that perspective. So um, when we're talking about what sort of rules are currently in place with medical marijuana, First, I will note that the Michigan Medical Marijuana Act allows for medical use of marijuana for people that are under 18. And there are particular extra things that have to be put in place. So we can't say you can't use marijuana if you're under 21. That would clearly violate the MMMA. When we're talking about the potential of there being recreational marijuana, um, there are, that, that does limit it to um, people that are over the age of 21 and there are some age restrictions in that potential um, statewide initiative. Now when we're talking about sort of targeting, marketing to youth, things like that, I do want to draw your attention to the fact that Lara's emergency rules as they exist right now for the medical marijuana facilities um, do limit or regulate um, uh, advertising to prevent it from, from targeting youth. And when we're talking about things like edibles and infusions, there are rules in place that prohibit them from being packaged with um, cartoons on them or looking like commercially, commercially available candy. So Lara's already doing some of these things. And so the idea from a, a licensing uh, perspective is the state's already kind of got that in place and will, we assume, continue to have that in place, particularly if the, the new state um, initiative passes to treat it like alcohol, I think it's reasonable to assume that a lot of these regulations will look like what alcohol looks like. So um, I hope that answers your questions on those points. Uh, Commissioner Kelly, did you have any follow -up questions about that? I, I, that? That's good information. I just wish that we um, we had a better sense too of, I'd like to still see the, like, the comparison between this and alcohol to be made more clear, particularly around distance. So, but that can be part of the discussion that we're coming up with. Yeah. 
Thank you. And it is difficult because recreational uh, is going to be voted on in November, mm -hmm. and we're trying to be proactive mm -hmm. um, in anticipation of a, of a possible approval, uh, which makes this discussion a little more challenging because we know that what we enact today will clearly impact recreational land use. So. Yeah, and I think you have to look at it through, if you're allowing medical, assume that wherever you allow medical, you're allowing recreational with the way that the recreational language is written. Right, Commissioner. Yeah, Suzanne, I didn't see one of the questions that um, came to me that I submitted, and again, like the mayor suggested, things have been moving quite rapidly. Um, so I don't see it in here, but I'm curious to know um, if what the response is to the question regarding is there a way to put provisions in our language that um, prevents any decision makers from um, investing in the business for a number of years, say five years? Um, because we've seen in other communities where elected officials or appointed officials to, to boards of, a, of city government have gotten into the business sometime after they were an elected official. So just curious to know, what your findings were with that. I'll leave that to Anita and Kristen because that's more of an ethics question, I believe. Uh, well, it's actually already regulated by, within Laura's rules and within the state law. There are, there are prohibitions against doing exactly those concerns. And there, there are um, timelines and things like that in terms of having an interest in a, in a business or not. And there are even limits on having, um, for example, certain types of facilities cannot be owned by the same, I think it's, can't remember now, but I believe it's like a, a processor. No, the secure <laughs> transport cannot have an interest in a grower and things like that. But there are already in place in the state law um, uh, things to help prevent your concerns. There. Okay, can, I'd can like you, to see what those yeah, are. Can you elaborate yeah. on what those are? Just out of curiosity, because we my head, but I can provide those for you. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. yeah, if you could send those to, because that has been a, a question I'm sure multiple, many of us have have heard, is that they're concerned about people being a part of the decision making that has a vested interest. So maybe we need to know that before we interview our candidates. This <laughs> 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 Any, any other, commissioners, any other um, ones you want, uh, Suzanne? I, I know that the question was a, raised by um, a number of you around accommodations for people of color as well as requirements around local hiring practices. Do you want to just touch on those? Sure. Um, for hiring people of color, um, uh, where's my question? The, um, because of Proposal 2, um, which is a Michigan constitutional ban on affirmative action, and likely equal protection clause of the U.S. Constitution. We cannot identify that. We were at um, a meeting recently where there was a gentleman who was representing that the city of Pontiac was going to be doing that practice. I did call the city of Pontiac and speak with um, Deputy Mayor Jane Basis de Sessa. So she actually was one of your candidates for city manager. Um, and Jane and I had a very nice conversation and she said no, um, that they're not doing anything that's race-based, but they are looking at local hiring. And so I did include uh, kind of underneath that local hiring number seven, what the city of Pontiac is looking at. They are currently proposing language that would require 30% of employees to be city residents. Um, and the a penalty is assessed. So they have looked at penalties in association with that. They also set um, a wage, but in Kristen's review of that, um, she felt that that was not permissible. So that would have to be something that's agreed upon. Um, the, that proposal, though, for the local hiring is done through Pontiac's proposed community benefits agreement. So that would be similar to when I mentioned the VITA and what you'd want for desired outcomes or targets that things that would be aspirational that you would expect people to look at and consider in the voluntary equitable development agreement as they approach the city, that that could be something that you, you bring up in discussion. Thank you, Commissioner Lanou, and then Commissioner Kelly. Suzanne, is it possible, so I think the local hiring provision is a good one to add in, um, but when we talk about um, African Americans being at the bottom of the Forbes article and that list, um, it isn't, that list wasn't tied to jobs, although we know in certain zip codes that the unemployment rate is higher, but it's, it's tied to ownership. Yeah. And so is there a way to put this same type of percentage on the owners that are local and from specific zip codes or from specific um, 
geographical locations or things of that nature. I don't know exactly how, and you all could probably do some research to figure it out, but ownership is key and critical. Mm -hmm. And jobs are important, but ownership is what actually gives the advantage that so, and this is how communities are disenfranchised time over time over time. And so I, I recognize that the state of Michigan is, is, is looking at this as they're considering what happens with recreational marijuana. But when I look at the provisions with recreational marijuana, it again is setting populations behind other populations. So it's almost like redlining. So everybody else get out the gate. You have however many years to do whatever it is you need to do. And then we're gonna open up the gate for other people. And so somehow locally, we need to figure out a way to be equitable about this and do as much research as we possibly can, find whatever loophole exists to make sure that we have the provisions in place so that we are doing this with equity in mind as opposed to only falling based on what we're seeing in other communities. If we need to be the forerunner in this, if we need to trail this blaze, let us do that so that we can do this right because we're the community who consistently are talking about equity. And I, I believe <clears throat> Commissioner Jones raised that very question about a week ago. So. And, and I totally, I totally understand. I mean, that's, I think the, what in looking at, and I think there can be a lot more research, and that's why in the timeline, is it's how do we do this with the Vita and the, and the marijuana money? Because I think Portland, when they're looking at communities of color and how do you build ownership, they have specific funds that go into the entrepreneurship and matching dollars and to be able to have people build ownership in that program. Can't do that through zoning, um, but there are other ways that this facilitates that ability to build capacity in a way that I think can build ownership. Um, but we have, to, we have to be very intentional about it, I agree. And it has to start at the same time everything else starts. Right. Because we can't do that once we get, we've been scrambling for this other stuff, we need to scramble for that. Yep. And figure out a way to do it at the moment that this passes at the same time. Yep. And I think that's where the, the micro business applications, I mean that's, that was part of the thinking and developing this upfront timeline, like let's start thinking about these things so they're in place by the time we start accepting applications, that we've got it all laid out. Commissioner Kelly, did you have a follow-up? Yeah, Probably a question for Kristen. Just I see you taking notes over there. Um, can we require proof from these businesses that start uh, that they are actually hiring locally? How do we do that? I know that with our, our bid discount program, for example, uh, the participants uh, in the construction industry have opt like that are part of the Monday group have primarily opted out of providing information about their own private enterprise in terms of how much they um, they work with minority businesses. They might, you know, it'll be part of a bid discount package, but in terms of really knowing, for us to really understand and know for, for that or for this, we would need to know more information about who they're actually hiring locally and persons of color. So in terms of those sort of questions, I think that is the idea of having some sort of VITA requirement or good neighbor requirement. I think that those might be, um, I think that's the vehicle for, for trying to ascertain that information. Okay. Just want to know if it's legal, how much we can legally require them to report back to us. <laughs> that, we'll have to look at. Okay. We, I mean, th this is a new area of law, so we right. don't know yet. And okay. we might we might be the ones to find out. <laughs> well, I, th I think we also can look to, um, I look back at Kara Wood, um, from Economic Development, because you have worked in that arena with tax credits. And, or, you know, as you're giving somebody a tax benefit, what are their job requirements and their hiring requirements, and at least job creation numbers. And so certainly we'd have to work with Kara on figuring out what's the best way to measure and report. Yeah. Good question. All right, commissioners, other questions? About to get into the discussion, there is, there, uh, You know what? There, having our questions answered is a I part of the discussion. <laughs> Commissioner, I, 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 I hear what you're saying, and I know you're eager to move forward. But well, this I, is, we need to have our questions answered. And I, and and I have questions of my own, and that hey. they relate to, you know. Okay. So. All right. So, I, just, so I don't want to diminish the value all. of this discussion or the questions being answered. If, if I could, there's, there's 
Two other, th well, three other things I want to mention very briefly. One, there was a question about why um, medical marijuana caregivers, all of a sudden this se section on home occupations is stricken. Um, Byron Township recently had a circuit court decision that came down last week. As we were drafting this and ready to send this into for, for agenda review, um, and they struck, the circuit court struck the home occupation provisions, <coughs> which affects our ordinance. So that tells you how quickly, we talk about how fast this industry is moving and how fast this stuff is happening in case law. The, the other Detroit decision, the Wayne County decision was in February of this year. So things are happening very quickly, and um, this is certainly an example of that, where just last week, and, and we're, since we're in the ordinance, we said we're just taking it out right now, and then it will have the licensing ordinance will have to come back to be amended as well. So I wanted to mention that. Also in the Q and A um, piece, there are two maps in the back. We were asked to prepare a map that showed the areas um, with uh, the, what happens with the thousand foot multi jurisdictional buffer um, that are affected by this, and uh, we also ran a five hundred foot. Um, so you could see how many parcels and facilities would be affected just for purposes of discussion. Um, and then we also received a request, the last page, which I do have the map up here to Commissioner Kelly's question about what does 500 feet look like? What does 600 feet look like? What is 1,000? Or I put 2,600 in there also because that's that that's approximately a half mile. That's all the GIS would give us. We couldn't get to 2640. Um, but that gives you an idea of how many blocks and one of the challenges in our neighborhood business districts. Uh, West Leonard is a good example that uh, you have blocks that are oriented north-south um, where the ends, so they're, they're short little blocks and then on the north side of the street they have longer blocks because their streets are oriented east-west. So it kind of depends but that at least gives you an idea for scale as far as when you're talking about separation distance uh, what that might look like. Great. Thank you. Okay. All right, commissioners, questions, comments? Commissioner? Yeah. Well, I mean, I'm trying to follow through on my motion here that I worked about making some thoughtful changes based upon the Planning Commission recommendation. And I think that's, first I want to say thank you to Suzanne and Kristen and their teams for doing the diligence and answering our questions. Um, I don't think the Planning Commission is perfect in, in their recommendation. And I appreciate the fact that the planning department tried to make some changes, but I struggle with some of these changes, especially as it relates to providing real opportunity for people in Grand Rapids to not only get access to the medicine they need, but potentially own businesses and start businesses. And I, I still think that the hybrid recommendation as, a, as you know, drafted from the planning department, um, as it relates to medical marijuana only, the micro business does not apply. Statutorily, the way the uh, medical marijuana uh, statute is written at the state, a micro business qualification is not part of that statute. And so while we may think that they, a, the hybrid with a micro business as it relates to uh, potential recreational marijuana exists, uh, statutorily speaking, we can't use that as a determining factor for medical marijuana businesses. So in all intents and purposes, uh, we are not allowing provisioning centers in our traditional business districts which is where they should be located if we're going to provide people in our community the access to the medicine that they need. Um, as it stands, the, the hybrid model as, as proposed by the, the planning department puts, allows the micro-businesses to exist in the future in TBA, but only for recreational marijuana. Um, and the, it would take a fix on the part of the legislature or the state to allow those businesses to exist. Um, so I, I have some ideas about how we can do this differently. Um, and I think, I, I think the biggest concern we hear is, it's kind of twofold. One is, we've heard resounding support from people in our community, both at the Planning Commission and, and at this table. There were 33 people that spoke in favor of this last time with no opposition. Um, now, do all those people live in Grand Rapids? No. Do, all those, do many of those people have interest in both ownership or access to the, or access to the medicine they need? Absolutely. Um, and we're going to get people from outside of our community. If we're the only a community in West Michigan that's willing to take on this tough issue and try to do right by the people both in our community and in our region. Like, we have to do this right the first time. And we have to provide protections so that, you know, it's, it's like anything, when you allow something to happen, um, it's hard to take it back. So we need to be thoughtful and start slow, but we still need to provide real opportunity. Um, and so what I think is, you know, what I really appreciated about the Planning Commission recommendations was it differentiated between uh, there's five uses. It differentiated between four of the uses and eventually a provisioning center. And so a growing facility or a transportation facility, uh, those absolutely belong in our industrial transportation districts, our 
uh, are, are high intensity use zone districts. Uh, but what they did say is provisioning centers should be allowed in our t traditional <laughs> business district so that you can access it from a public transportation line, a bike, a car, you can get there to get the medicine that you need. And so um, they had made the recommendation and actually took the department's recommendation of a 600 foot separation distance and made it 1,000 feet. Um, which I think is great that, that, that when, you, when, we, when we, we don't want to concentrate impact, we want to spread impact out. Um, but the challenge in this is that the, the way the administration ordinance is written, it requires a 250 foot separation from a residential use. So for all intents and purposes, it removes all of our traditional business districts from having provisioning centers. And so we need to, the, the, as the motion that's on the floor is to adopt the Planning Commission recommendation, we've removed that, which is what it should be. But my suggestion would be let's expand the separation distance between provisioning centers. So as it stands, it's currently about 1,000 feet. I would propose that we make it 2,000 feet. And the reason for that is to say, if you look at, you know, Suzanne used West Leonard as the example, the distance from, um, US 131 to Alpine Avenue, which is the majority of the first part of, of the district, is uh, 2,800 feet. Okay, and then the, the distance from Alpine Avenue to Valley Avenue is uh, 3,200 feet. So that's just shy of five, right around 5,000 feet total. Well, if you put one in the middle of both of those sections, it eliminates the rest of the, the area from consideration for a second use. So you're only going to get the potential of two. But what that does do is opens up the entire pool of properties along that corridor to find the best property that, can, that, that, a, that a business can locate in, right? Like, if we want to provide real opportunity for small people in Grand Rapids to have access, if we say, you only get these 40 properties to pick from, it's going gonna, it's gonna to drive the cost of those properties through the roof, and no one locally is going to have an opportunity to purchase those properties because it's going to be the big players that come in. But if we say, let's open it up to have a large opportunity of properties, but once one is selected, it, it eliminates everything else around it so the concentration impact doesn't happen. Um, I think that is, that is the solution to make sure that the, the, the people in our community, without having some of the other tools that we may or may not want to be able to try to guide this to local people, this gives local players the greatest opportunity to try to get into the market of, of a provisioning center. And it, you know, I'm not an expert in this, but I have to imagine that a provisioning center is the easiest category to get, one of the easiest categories to get into based on, you know, to buy a growing facility in an, an industrial district is going to cost a significant more than leasing a storefront on West Leonard Street or on Bridge Street or on Fulton Street or on Wealthy Street. Like, it's going to be the easiest point to be able to secure real estate. Um, I think we should add the $5,000 back in. There's no reason we shouldn't have the, the fee if we can collect it. Like, that's a, we should totally add the $5,000. I'm, I'm, I'm struggling with the language that exists in uh, section 5.9.19, uh, medical marijuana, it says marijuana facilities, A, the purpose. Marijuana related uses, which because of their nature have some serious objectionable characteristics. If we're talking about medical marijuana, it's medicine. Why is that objectionable? I, I, I think that language needs to be struck. We can leave the rest in, I understand um, the remainder of the, the intensity of use that matters, but to say that it's objectionable when it's clearly been classified as medicine by both the state uh, and government and, and here locally, I, I, I don't think that that's appropriate. Um, yeah, I also think we should offer the opportunity similar to, you know, Commissioner Kelly keeps talking about how we compare it to alcohol use. Uh, for an alcohol use in the state of Michigan, that uh, requires a 500 foot distance from a church or a school. Uh, we do allow the church or the school to have uh, the ability to waive that distance. Um, and I think uh, one of the speakers at the last meeting talked about Brewer Vivant being across the street from Congress Elementary um, and being a good partner and operating in that, in that space as a, as a good, productive neighborhood businesses, business that supports the community. And so uh, I think we need to give the ability of the people who are most directly impacted being adjacent to those properties, the ability to say, yeah, I'm okay with this. Um, you know, and I can point to numerous examples of how that exists in our community. Um, and I think the, the last thing is, there's a, this is a question for you, Suzanne. In the ordinance, you write that the Planning Commission does not, cannot waive any portion of this ordinance. Uh, are there other ordinances in place that does not allow the Planning Commission to waive, or is this a, is, are we singling out this particular industry as uh, having the, not having that ability? 
So what we um, did, oh gosh, I want to say maybe 2012, um, what we found is with special land use requests that we gave the Planning Commission the ability to waive uh, certain elements within mm -hmm. a special land use. We have use performance standards in the use re regulations of Article 9. Uh, we did that so that we were not seeing two trips to both Planning Commission and Board of Zoning Appeals for applicants. And since the Planning Commission was already conducting a public hearing, we felt that um, they, would, they would be able to take that into consideration. We did propose that for alcohol use in the original amendments that we would not allow um, waivers for alcohol. Now that, based on our recent discussion, is, is not going to be in there. So this would be one of the only ones, although um, we have gotten feedback from the Board of Zoning Appeals and from members of the community from time to time about maybe some of the requirements in the use regulations should be referred to the Board of Zoning Appeals. Mm -hmm. In this case, the concern would be, especially if the separation distance requirements are an integral portion of this ordinance and that the City Commission and their intent of approving this ordinance is based around those separation distances, that um, a more rigorous standard, which would be the Board of Zoning Appeals variance requirements, would need to be met rather than the Planning Commission's um, review of it in the meeting of the Planning Commission standards, which is why it was written that um, the Planning Commission could not waive the use regulations, that instead if somebody was coming in, and we have heard of this in other communities, we just uh, talked to Battle Creek yesterday, that what they're seeing is that they're getting variance requests then for those separation distance requirements. So we didn't want to, we wanted to more of a checks and balance with this from, uh, from starting off. Um, Susanna, I have a question based on um, Commissioner O'Connor's recommendation. Can you can you plug in that if we increase from a thousand feet from another facility to two thousand and tell us how many um, locations that would allow? We yeah, we can do that. I can't do this at this moment, but yeah, we can have staff do that today. Okay. And I, w I would like to just and I appreciate the, you know you sent me a list, Suzanne, of the two hundred and eight potential addresses based on the initial planning department recommendation. And so I took the time to look up 100 of these um, with the help of our friends at Kent County and their GIS system and our assessor department and pulled literally 100 properties up and looked at every single one of them. Um, and so if there's a little bit of uh, the zoning is broad. It just says what's in the box is in the box. But at the same time, when you actually pull the parcels and look at in them individually and determine, well, could that be a facility? Could that not be a facility? Would that work? Would that not work? It's really... There are so many places on here that have no potential of ever being a medical marijuana facility in any regard. I mean, the, the very first property, 622 Ann Street Northwest, is a landlocked parcel between two railroad tracks. That's 50 by 40. Like, that's never going to be a medical marijuana facility. Uh, there's landlocked parcels off of Alpine behind Crystal Flash. There is the Crystal Flash headquarters, which is a, a, a gasoline transportation facility. That's never turning into medical marijuana. There's the Hudsonville Products Building that we just gave a tax incentive to to bring a bunch of jobs into our community. That's not going to turn into medical marijuana. There are 35 houses north of Richmond between Richmond and Ann Street that are zoned commercial but are contained with, but, but are functioning as single family and two family properties. We're not going to allow any of those to turn into medical marijuana facilities given the, the, the conversation around affordable housing. There's a cell phone tower on uh, the Grand River north of Leonard Street. There's the Kent County Department of Public Works building. There's the MDOT facilities uh, off of Turner. Like, these are not actual opportunity sites. So to say that there's 208 potential sites that exist in our community that could have this, there's really not. Um, and so we can talk about being 1,900 potential sites given some changes, but when you go and look at all those individual parcels, they're not really opportunity sites for medical marijuana. So I just, I, I'm just trying to use those examples to allay some concern. Like we, it's hard to pick out individual parcels in using zoning because you have to kind of overlay it based on separation distances. Um, just again, that's why I think some of the setting the separation distances further apart is really the mechanism that we need to be able to control the growth of this. Uh, and in the future, if you know. We prove we do this well because I think we are going to prove that we can do this well and better than anyone else. We have the ability to then, we can reduce separation distances in the future to provide additional opportunities. All right. I'm going to allow other commissioners to weigh in and share their thoughts and comments. Um, and I, I appreciate you sharing that. I, I think, though, we need to be mindful that properties do change hands. And in other cities, people are paying um, far more than what a property is appraised for mm -hmm. in order to have a location. So again, I, I think we have to be mindful not to assume 
that that's not going to happen in some of these locations. But, but I, I think that I understand that point. I, there are certainly some commercial buildings that you know may or may not be able to transfer for higher prices. I'm saying but there are some parcels like the Kent County to Public, Public Works building, the MDOT facilities, consumers power poles, railroad track. These are never going to be sites because they're not. They, they functionally either aren't big enough, they're landlocked, or uh, the, the use is a public use, and so they're not. They're, there's no. There's no actual opportunity there. So we need to make be mindful that, you know, the open market is one thing, but the, the, a closed municipal market is different. Yeah. Um, so I'll start with Commissioner Linear. Thank you, Commissioner O'Connor, um, for, you know, coming to the table today with creative ways to address this very complex mm -hmm. issue. Um, I think what's interesting about this is, is you're more well studied on this topic than I am and um, and I think there's logic to what you're suggesting with the 2,000 foot distance the issue that I'm faced with is I don't I don't quite understand what that will mean so like the mayor just asked Suzanne you know can we now throw that in and see what that means for the number of facilities that you know how will those numbers change basically um, but it actually is a symptom of a bigger problem, and the problem is we're trying to make a decision really quickly that is extremely complex that I don't know that I fully understand. And I think that's what we're faced with. I understand the threat um, of, you know, having ballot language that potentially could impact us worse. But I would hope that citizens who reside in our city, who know us all pretty much personally, would be willing to sit down at the table and, and work on this the way we work on these types of complex issues. It isn't one perspective pushing on the system and getting an outcome that they're suggesting that they want. It's working together with people from opposing opinions, sitting, sitting down at the table to come up with the best solution to this very complex problem. And I think what you've brought to the table, which some of those things are different from what the Planning Commission suggested, is exactly what you get when you're able to spend time with people who have opposing opinions. And I just think that we're in a position where we shouldn't be making the decision this quickly. And, and as long as I've been a commissioner, and as long as I've been closely following city government, this is unheard of. You know, we talked about alcohol, early, just the agenda item before this. We've been wrestling with that issue for quite some time. That's, that's an example. We talked about fire pits and backyards. That's another example. There are so many examples of things that are complex with people having polar opposite opinions and us trying to make the right decision. And most of the time, um, putting together some task force to truly look into this, not have staff scrambling, working late hours for the last few weeks. God bless you, Suzanne, and your team. You too, Kristen, for all of the hours you all have put into this in order to try and get as much information to us as quickly as possible so that we can make the best informed decision based on the information we have. This isn't, that's not good government. When everybody's spent, tired, and you know, informed as best that we possibly can. So tomorrow we make a decision today, and tomorrow we learn just through conversations or more research that that wasn't the best decision. Now, I'm not in favor of bureaucracy and trying to draw things out and things of that nature either, but this just isn't the best way to handle this because you probably could convince me of the 2,000 because in, in the few minutes that you've explained it, it makes sense. Because I don't want to saturate the dispensaries in specific neighborhoods either. But I'm leery because I don't have enough information. And I, quite frankly, don't like making decisions in these types of instances. So there are a couple other points that I want to make. Um, and you know, I think it would be interesting to know more about, because Commissioner Kelly, I think your suggestion about the SIDS and BIS and them weighing in and that approval process, I think that's a really good one. But to, to Suzanne's point about there being neighborhoods without SIDS and BIDS, you know, how do we go about making sure that those neighborhoods are included? We have in the third ward um, six 
um, SIGs and bids that, that are kind of tied to, well, not six SIGs and bids, but six business districts that are tied to um, a SID or bid. So, um, but there are several other business districts that wouldn't be able to weigh in. The other thing I want to make mention of, and Suzanne, at whatever point you want to come back and, and respond to some of this, is there was some language, and I'm not sure exactly how it was written, but there was language that talked about addressing the concerns of our municipal neighbors and making sure that where we're putting um, provisional centers isn't close to those boundaries. I am not in favor of that. Um, 28th Street happens to be a really, in my opinion, a really good location for these. And it's really close to a couple of, a couple of our neighbors. And I respect that they have an opinion about this, but if it's in my ward, and if it's in the city of Grand Rapids and it's a good location, then we need to stand firm on that as opposed to pushing it into the neighborhood in order to, to help them to pacify our municipal neighbors who some of their constituents have been contacting us asking us to do this because they want access to their medicine as well. So, you know, as you're looking at this, you may want to look at that language to make some adjustments if others agree with that. And I think. Those were the only few questions that, or comments I wanted to make. And, and I, I, uh, I'm going to ask maybe Kristen or Suzanne to speak to timeline. I, and, and Commissioner, I think all of us share your concern that we are um, feeling under pressure to make a decision because of the threat of not just the, uh, the ballot language, which unfortunately would put us in a, in a worse place, quite frankly. Um, but I, I think ha explaining that um, would be really helpful and the timeline I'm not I have my city our city attorney here saying we don't have much flexibility in adjusting this timeline but m maybe one or both of you can speak to that or maybe all of us <laughs> for all of you as <laughs> well as um, responding to Commissioner Lanier's other questions because yeah. what I think what you have to consider is where do we have the most control to do what's in the best interest for our, our citizens and so if you adopt an ordinance, a base language ordinance, we can always amend and have more control over it. If we wind up with it on the ballot and they vote that ordinance in, then we cannot change it or to make a change, then we're going to have to wind up in litigation over the language. So if we look at where do we have the most control to do what's in the best interest of the citizens. Um, my thought, and you certainly both weigh in, my thought is that we adopt a ordinance and then we have control to amend it whatever way we deem that it's necessary to be in the best interest. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, to, to clarify, um, I think that our proposed land use ordinance here actually can be read harmoniously with the safe and I want to say safe and sound, smart and safe uh, GR uh, initiative in that that is not zoning and this one is. My concern is you think we're harried now, wait until we have a business activity license passed and we have no zoning regulations if you don't act. Because what will happen is that doesn't mean, whoop, we didn't pass any zoning regulations, we can't have it in the city. No, we've opted in. And so we have to use the normal procedures that already exist to um, find where the zoning is appropriate. And under the zoning code, that's the use determination. Um, so either we legislate through the democratic legislative process and open meetings, or we leave it to the use determination, which is done by one career bureaucrat, um, who's incredibly intelligent. Um, <laughs> and I love career bureaucrats because I happen to be one. But I think this is a situation where this really needs to come from the legislative body. And we're asking and begging you yep. <laughs> to make a decision and tell us what to do here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So can I, can I ask yeah. a question? clarifying question? So, so if we, well, tonight I think we're making a decision. Um, so when the decision is made and in the event that it is approved, um, going back to what you're asking, Mayor, about the timeline, is there a way to make the effective date um, to push the effective date out so that then we can continue to spend time learning before we put whatever the practice will be in place because and, and make and then we can make those amendments if we need to during during that it could be next meeting because we've learned something new and we've got a 
Yeah. Once it's adopted, once it's adopted, we can amend it at any point after that. But yeah. I, think, I think having the adoption is. I think I think it, I think to the, the attorney's point is it's having something in place that we can certainly consider. Mm -hmm. uh, we can make amendments anytime we want. Mm -hmm. Just next have, month, September. Right. But if the effective date in in the language is October, is what I read. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Could we push that out to November or December sure. to give us more time to look at some of these nuances? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. <laughs> okay. Absolutely. To uh, Commissioner Lanier, I, I heard three questions, and, and I actually did some math, <laughs> which wasn't that hard. I mean, the, the blessing and the curse of going through so many iterations of maps is that actually if we look at the Planning Commission map, Per, for provisioning centers, which I have up here. Mm -hmm. um, the maximum business locations with the 1,000 foot separation is 143. So if we went to 2,000 feet for separation, uh, you know, there might be a couple that nudge back and forth, but I think you could assume half that number. Yeah. So 70-ish um, would be the number that you would get with, com with Commissioner O'Connor's suggestion okay. of 2,000 versus. Mm -hmm. okay. But we, would, we, would, we can run the exact numbers, but I mean, logic would say if it's a thousand and you're having it, you have that number. If you're increasing it to two thousand. Okay. Um, right. To the to the question about business district engagement, uh, in the ordinance we're proposing a good neighbor plan, which requires engagement of neighbors and businesses uh, in for the business to have those that communication, and we lay out in the good neighbor plan what that would look like. Uh, and in areas where we do not have an organized association, the planning department does provide them with contact information based on a radius in that area so that the expectation is whether or not there is an association, that's not an excuse to not engage the neighbors, that you're still going to do postcards and hold a meeting and do everything else to engage those who are potentially affected. Huh? Um, and then on the, on the question of uh, joining jurisdictions, mm -hmm. Uh, I don't. I do not have that map in here. It is in your handout on the on the dais, and it's on the back of that Q and A piece. Mm -hmm. Of course, I grabbed the wrong handout. That I'm looking at. Um, in in that case, the um, Amanda. I think that's really up to you. We did hear from. All of your uh, surrounding, all of our surrounding jurisdictions, townships, and cities, um, expressing concern um, with the use and a desire to see um, the 1,000 foot buffer. But as shown in the maps, clearly um, there is a lot of there is a lot of play as far as if you included those areas um, with that multi-jurisdictional buffer. Certainly, 28th Street you do pick up a lot of properties as you do um, Village and Apps Crossing area, uh, a little bit. So your major corridors basically, Plainfield, East Beltline, um, 28th Street, 44th Street, you pick up additional sites. Mm -hmm. And then, but then if I'm understanding correctly, once a site is in place, then the, right, the, dis the separation begins. Correct. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yep. Mm -hmm. So we gave you rough numbers. So if there was a 500-foot buffer instead of no buffer at all, uh, we looked at how many how many additional, and we assumed the hybrid approach. So it would go from the current the current hybrid approach would encourage a thousand-foot buffer, which would give you 98 potential <coughs> potential facility locations and 1,200 parcels. Mm -hmm. If you took that down to 500 feet, that's about a little over 1,300 parcels and 104 potential facility locations. And then if you took it down to zero, you get up to 143 facility locations. Mm -hmm. um, now that assumes, though, you still have, in, in the proposed recreational language, they still have language in there about a 1,000-foot separation from schools. Mm -hmm. So th those numbers might be a nudge lower, depending on what's on the other side for uh, their potentially sensitive uses. So could we... Could we then, Mayor, you know, as we were talking about Plainfield, Alpine, and 28th Street for housing, hmm. could then, could we then look at incentivizing where we would want these? So in some of these districts, like a 28th Street, where there's ample opportunity, um, is, there, is, that, is there a possibility for doing that? Yeah, I think you could, we would have to look at how, we could make a distinction in the C zone districts, which is the straight commercial zone district, mm -hmm. which is where 28th Street and 44th Street, those are in C districts, not TBAs, mm -hmm. not the traditional business area. We could look at um, separation distance there 
and and lessen that so if you wanted to have a more conservative approach in the neighborhood business districts and a more open approach on those major corridors. Mm -hmm. They are MDOT routes. I mean, 28th Street certainly is, as is East Beltline. Um, so there is infrastructure in place. The attractive thing, I think, for the industry would be the amount of parking that they could right. have right. versus the others. And and transit. Right. In transit. Yeah. Suzanne, can I ask a question? I'm sorry, Commissioner Kelly, and then I'll get to Commissioner Kelly. Uh, if we increase the mm -hmm. buffer zone um, also for medical marijuana facilities in addition to provisioning centers, what would, if we doubled that, can we just assume that it would be half of, is that a good assumption that it's about, it would reduce that by half a potential Are you parcels. saying for the planning commission recommendation? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what's on the table right now. So yeah, they have the 600 foot in the, for all the other uses outside of provisioning. Yeah, center. so that's 293, so I would assume, so it's right now 600, so it would go to 1200. No, I think she meant double it, like, I think yeah, it would go, so it'd, it'd go it's, from 600 to 300. Or make it consistent with provisioning centers at 2,000 between facilities. Yeah. I think the one thing I would say to keep in mind, and we would just have to think about how the, the one of the challenges in treating them differently is that we allow for co-location. So we allow provisioning centers to be with grow and processing. Um, and so if we're now, tr we might have a grow and processing, but you can't have a provisioning center because we have that different rule for provisioning. So I would have to run the numbers to know really what, that one would be a little bit more complicated. Okay, all right. Um, Commissioner Kelly. Yeah, I, I do want, I am in support of looking at the 2,000 feet uh, between facilities and, and the parking issue. When you gave us, well, in the compendium, they talked about um, parking being and traffic being one of those concerns and we're you know we hear about it all the time so to be, be able to provide space along those business corridors I you know I appreciate the fact that we asked and talked about this with our our neighboring jurisdictions but and it'd be ideal if we could look at this on a, on a Google map but which I've done now and I see that across the street it's commercial too so it's not like we're running into to residential it for our neighboring jurisdictions um, $5,000 I, I certainly want to keep and maybe that's an area where we can incentivize to Commissioner Lanier's point particularly for uh, businesses that we're wanting to support and then once we incentivize as I understand it from Kristen's comments that that's when we can also require some reporting on going around local hiring and so on. Um, so let's see. To, oh, and the other thing I didn't just just a um, concern that I have about these single families that um, John mentioned. Maybe we need to look at rezoning them and protecting those at some point too. Take a look at those those areas, all of them, and find out if there are single family um, areas in there that we need to think. Oh, okay, protect. because potentially they could be purchased, and under this, you know, they could be turned into mar marijuana facilities. We don't want to lose any of those homes. Yeah, so it's a, I want to make a distinction between uses and districts. So, okay. um, the in Commissioner O'Connor's example, that so we have 250 feet from a residential zone district, mm -hmm. which is the lines in the map. But you could have a residential use within a commercial district. I so think, that's I think that's not, what she's trying to speak to is right, the fact yeah. that they are a residential use in a commercial district and we don't want to see those go away. Right? Right. I don't think any of us want to see those proud. They're all occupied, assumed, yeah. you know, occupied and yeah. not, not turned into something else. I think that's a, exactly. I think. Yeah. So that would be a good master plan discussion. I know uh, Swan went through that with identifying kind of cores and connectors where they wanted to see concentrated <laughs> commercial development and where they wanted to see residential development. and. They went through and designated those areas, and we changed the zoning maps accordingly. Okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, Commissioner Jones, and then Commissioner Park. Thank you, Mayor. Um, let's see. Um, <laughs> Where to start? Yeah. <laughs> uh, a couple things. Uh, first and foremost, um, I appreciate uh, my colleague Commissioner O'Connor's. Um, uh, thoughts this morning, his recommendation for us to again consider the Planning Commission's um, plan. And I, um, I appreciate it for a couple of reasons. One is, is because I just, I know for a fact that we are not going to find anything resembling a, a perfect plan. I will tell you that I have tried to study this as best as I possibly could um, and am still 
full of questions um, and significant concerns. I would like to take a moment to recognize um, you know, our friends from uh, the King County Prevention Coalition and their real leg legitimate concern about the effects of marijuana on our youth. I think that what makes this all the more complex is we're talking about medical marijuana and the decision that we're making today, uh, yet I think we're trying to operate with tremendous foresight uh, for what is potentially going to come to us. But I think that that, that is a legitimate concern. I would uh, reference the, um, the remarks of or the, the, the commentary that came from uh, an article recently from the USA Today that spoke to uh, the comments that were made by the governor of Colorado, who uh, put it out there that um, you know the, uh, the, the passing of a law for recreational marijuana in the state of Colorado hasn't had as bad as an effect um, as was uh, initially reported. Apparently, after digging and some studies that were done, in particular Harvard University study indicated that um, there is an increase in uh, youth who are being adversely affected. There's an increase in homelessness. There's an increase in, in, in many areas that are obviously affecting one's quality of life. And so, although that is something that again, we could talk about, but again, it's not law until it, if it passes in, in November. So uh, I think we have to keep on top of mind you know, the, the very real fact that we're going to be perhaps facing the, some of the same realities here in our city and obviously in our state. And so um, there was also a request from our friends at the, um, from, from Kent County Prevention Coalition about having language that really speaks to uh, penalizing, penalizing those uh, companies, those licensees who you know, sell to those under 21. I heard Kristen loud and clear that we can't necessarily speak to that as it pertains to medical. But again, uh, I want to make perfectly, I want to make sure that if this does pass in November, the recreational side of things, uh, I take it that we will have an opportunity to, to specifically develop language that speaks to that as well later on. Correct? Mm -hmm. Am I correct in that assumption? We okay. could do that or reference the state. Could we reference the state statute? No, we incorporate. Or could we pass our own ordinance? We can so long as it doesn't conflict with the state, state law. law. I will yeah. say there, I would like something stronger than what's in state law, but we're going to be probably limited. Um, how you can deal with that is enforcement, so with what already exists and go after a license if you have repeat offenders. Like what you do with um, liquor that's up. Oh. Thank you. <laughs> uh, quick recap. Um, so the state ballot initiative does have language in there about the types of penalties for people that violate that state law, including marijuana establishments, because that's the word used in the, the state initiative. Um, we would be lim we our local laws cannot conflict with what that state law would be. Um, I will say I, I wish they were a little more aggressive. I, I would prefer that. They're not. Um, that's not to say we can't get creative. And I know with like liquor control, for example. What we'll do is GRPD, for example, if we have um, a, 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 a alcohol license as a repeat offender for selling to minors, we go to the Liquor Control Commission and try to see if they'll do some licensing um, provisions. And that's really that's really the hook when okay. we're talking about things like that is, is going after the license. Okay. Yeah, I would. Yeah, I would be in favor of uh, some very strong language to the point of. Fines are one thing, but I mean, almost like a, a uh, you know, a, a three strike deal where they need to have their license pulled um, if they have developed a habit of selling to those who are underage. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we need to uh, be very intentional and very uh, forceful about uh, making that perfectly clear that we will not stand for, you know, this because again, based on what I've read from what's happening other, in, in other parts of the country, we, to some degree, should expect it here. And, and I think in, in all of this, in all of our discussions, I think what I, find, what I found to be most interesting is, you know, we've heard from a number of folk from our community. We have heard from folk who don't even live in Michigan. We have heard from experts. We have heard from consultants. Um, and yet, there, sometimes there seems to be this belief that we should just uh, turn down the volume on the noise or what is happening in other parts of the country and other parts of the state, as if it's not going to happen here. 
Um, now, Grand Rapids could be described as a very magical place, no <laughs> doubt about it. But for us to assume that, um, you know, that, that we're not going to experience both the good and the bad of what's occurred in other parts of our country, that's just, that's, that's foolish. And, and so I, I think it would be wise on our part, and I think we've done this to the best of our ability, to really listen to and learn from the lessons of those who have come before us, who have done this. Uh, again, there, there, there is no, I mean, I, case in point, I've yet to see any state get it right when it comes to minority ownership. Other than, let's just, you know, call it what it is, I'd love to go, I wrote her name down, Shelly Edgerton, I hope she's watching this, I hope she, she gets a copy of this, she's the director of LARA. Shelly, Miss Edger, Edgerton, she needs to understand that as we move forward, you know, if, 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 if you want to do right by this, if you really want to do right by this, it would be to take a stance to do everything we possibly can as a state within the law to provide every opportunity possible for licenses to be held and owned by people of color and those who have been disenfranchised and those who have been on the short end of the stick when it comes to marijuana being seen as illegal. I don't see any other, I, I, I don't, Colorado, Colorado I've, read, I've read about efforts in Colorado, Oregon, I mean it's such a significant lift to try to get to a place where equity kicks in. Yeah. It's, a, it's a difficult issue. It's a very, very difficult issue. We have researched it. You yes. did ask me. Yes. We did do the research and we're, we're not finding a great answer at this point. No, no. But we'll keep, we'll keep trying. And I'll tell you what, I got no problem sitting here and telling those who belong to, is it Big Cannabis? I'm not, you know, I don't want to be seen as the most welcoming city when it comes to big cannabis coming in with a bunch of folk who are investors who aren't taking into consideration providing some on-ramps for ownership for those who've been historically marginalized. Because essentially what we're looking at is, you know, uh, nothing short of big box development or, you know, or the, again, big cannabis who's able to come in, drop the dollars needed, be approved by the state and open up shop. And there's no opportunity for those who are local, unless they, they too have the dollars to be able to play in that arena. And so, and I know that we've been, you know, some of us have been, you know, we've, we've had contact. There are those who are, who, uh, who are owners of, of, uh, of companies, big cannabis companies, who have contacted us, mm -hmm. who have tried to share, who have tried to, I think, in many ways humanize who they are and, 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 and hopes that we would uh, perhaps soften our stance and be open to their entry into this market. And I don't think it's anything wrong with us saying, you know what, obviously we can't stop it, but you know, the, the, the idea of making it perfectly clear that what we would appreciate, what we would want to celebrate is any opportunity in which local ownership is seen as a priority as they're coming into our market. Because I think anything less, we're just kind of, you know, falling in line with every other city, every other state that's involved in this space. Um, one other thing I want to mention is um, there was, a, a, with regards to the $5,000 fee, I think that, uh, again, it being something around, pro, you know, being proactive around uh, ownership, minority ownership, is this idea of that fee, perhaps there's a sliding scale there. Uh, I know we have 5000 as the annual fee, and perhaps it should be different for different sectors. Mm -hmm. uh, again, any, any incentive that we can use to try to engage uh, minority ownership is something that we should consider. Uh, I also want to suggest, and this is in support of what um, Commissioner O'Connor has mentioned, I think as I talk with both folks in the, in the, in the, in the neighborhoods as well as small business owners, you know, one of the biggest concerns is folks just don't, they're afraid of having, you know, a plethora of dispensaries scattered throughout the city. And that's a legitimate concern. But I also understand that with these 41 licenses that are being recommended by the planning department, we would be looking at the five, um, the five licenses, which are growers, processors, 
provisioning center, secure transporters, and a safety compliance facility. So, you know, I think people are somewhat confused in thinking that we're going to have 41 um, the dispensaries, right? Which is not the case. However, for those who feel as if we need to have adequate amount of dispensaries in our city, perhaps we should consider a cap for the number of dispensaries that we would have in our city. Because I don't see many people uh, wanting to protest the idea of having a, uh, a grower or a transporter or a safety compliance facility over in an industrial area. I don't see much pushback from that. I hear pushback from the idea of having a dispensary sitting in a central business or, or in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a commercial business district or in the middle of a neighborhood. And I will tell you, my, my last concern is, what, I've, what, what I'm understanding about Colorado is you have, because of how their law is set up, you have a number of dispensaries that are now sitting in low-income communities in Colorado that are occupied primarily by people of color. And that is the thing that I'm most concerned with, is that this turns into that same type of activity where we have you know, pockets within our city where we have low-income um, residents, and there, there is where you find dispensaries. But again, the idea of the 2,000 um, foot um, rule coupled with perhaps a cap on the number of dispensaries that we would have in the city is something that we should consider. So, so um, Commissioner, I'm going to have Suzanne, I think all of us have had conversations with, about caps, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, We've heard from residents as well wanting there to be a firmer line when it comes to a cap. Uh, some cities have tried that and it's been a little problematic. Um, and then the other question is the number. So I know Kalamazoo is looking at no more than maybe 14. I think Lansing is looking at no more than 25. I think Muskegon put it at seven. Um, but they've done that largely through distance requirements is my understanding. So there's, there's kind of a mix. So Suzanne, can you speak to that? I know this was early on one of the uh, items that we researched, looking at what is the, what is the better option. Yeah, uh, there's, really, there's really two main components that some communities are using. One is, one is zoning, which is what we're proposing. Uh, licensing is another approach, and doing a lot through licensing. From um, a, ability to, to manage it for the city commission, we felt that zoning was a better approach because you can't go through petitions and changes and, and that. So the, the licensing approach, some do have caps. The criteria for that ranges um, everything from um, a point system on who gets the license. Uh, and one of the concerns that we've seen and where there's been litigation is and how, who, how did you decide? Uh, it's pretty subjective rather than clear, here's the separation, this is the number, and then the market figures it out. Um, when you get into licensing to determine that number and how those numbers hit, um, it, there is some subjectivity to it, and it's something that we did want to avoid on um, being involved with that. So that was the, the major concern for us was just having a straight number because how do you choose? And the administrative components to that, then do you keep a wait list? So if that one doesn't go through all the way through Lara and get their licensing, then who's next in line to be able to choose? And then how are you making those, those decisions? I want to be very clear on any of this. This is going to be an administrative nightmare. If you go, I mean, pl the Planning Commission recommendation is 2,600 parcels. That means we could get, I mean, 2,600 requests, and then you have to sort through the application and how all that works. So that is a concern. Um, we, we have um, talked to communities about their points and how they add those up and, and how they allocate them. You can, through licensing, look at some different things. Like you could rank uh, a community benefits agreement as part of the licensing and see how that, that follows up. Um, but that may or may not 
be a determinant uh, when you come to litigation as far as whether or not you should have been doing that in the first place. So there's there's just, I think we felt that we were opening it up a lot more, and I don't know if Kristen has any more discussion on it. But we do know that communities have really struggled with the caps, and we wanted a much more clear standpoint. The view that we took was that this is another land use, okay. and we okay. were trying to regulate it as such. Okay, I'll, I'll let you stop there only because Commissioner Part has been waiting to say something. So yeah, I want to turn to him and give him a chance <laughs> since he hasn't had an opportunity yet. <clears throat> yeah, so um, yeah, I've been taking all this in and I, I think that I appreciate the heavy lift on the front end from the planning department. That's where the most of the work happened to get us to that, that first recommendation. And, uh, and yet, I think that as we looked at those parcels to my colleague's point, you know, I get this picture in my mind of somebody with Alzheimer's going to an industrial zone trying to get the medicine that he needs to stop his tremors, you know, or his Parkinson's. Um, and so I came in here today wanting to see some sort of a hybrid, which um, I was appreciative of that. I think that the Planning Commission asked all the right questions and did their job as we've commissioned them to do, to look at land use, and they even stopped short of the things that they didn't think were in their purview as a Planning Commission. Um, and so while I appreciate the hybrid, because when we talked on the phone, it got my wheel spinning about how can we get this to a place that will allow it to be in the right place. You know, it's really our job to make the sausage up here on this, around this table. And so to Commissioner Lanier's point, I know I'm with you. I don't like to make decisions on the spot. I like to have all the information, but I do believe, I'm confident that what John is proposing here really is a hybrid solution. It's just, it's different than the one that the planning department came, came up with. And, and I think that the thing for me is, I like to make decisions about what I know is true right today. This micro business thing, gosh, I hope we get to have a conversation about what that might look like in Grand Rapids. We don't know if that's gonna actually be reality. So I like talking about what we know today as reality. And so I feel like if we add these things, I'm all for it, the five thousand dollar fee. For me, for me, I'm not really as concerned about my ownership in these particular businesses. While I would love for that to happen, can we use this money that we're going to collect? Because I would love to. I look forward to the conversation about disbursement of receipts as well. <laughs> we just we just had a, awarded a contract to Grand Rapids area black businesses for eighty thousand dollars to stimulate black business owner owned business in Grand Rapids. Can we leverage this money here to triple that investment? You know, and uh, while they might not be people in, in the marijuana industry, they're going to be in, they're going to be, you know, perpetuating the businesses that we want to see happen here, um, in different different arenas. And so I'm supportive of the fee. I came in here kind of wanting to honor our municipality's request, but I do think that it is those are some of the best spots for this, where there is ample parking. Um, and it's, it's not gonna affect a neighborhood. So I do wanna talk about that. If we decide to restrict it, then I do think that per John's, um, you know, kind of quip at other meetings is, we gotta send a strong letter to them in return saying, start up a housing fund, use your project-based vouchers for affordable housing and link with us on that and have some really strong things around other outcomes we wanna see. Uh, I, I too think that in order to get the balance that I think that the community, the community that's wanting some restriction involved, I do think a 2,000 foot buffer allows us to test it. And uh, so yeah, I think that this is a different version of a hybrid that is really dealing with what we know right now today. And so it's our job to make the sausage up here. I appreciate all of the work and I do hope that we get a chance to talk through some of those other things. but. This to me, the certainty that I have and in, in, in considering this is we're dealing with facts that we know today. And so that's, I, I, I do think that it, this is a, a, a hybrid between what the planning department came up with and what the planning commission recommended. Um, let me clarify one thing though. <clears throat> Let's say hypothetically, the amendments that Commissioner O'Connor are, are um, approved or supported and we moved to a 2,000 foot distance requirements. That opens up roughly 75 locations. If, if we have an influx of um, individuals from outside the community who come in and they, they buy up the 75 potential opportunity sites, 
then when and if, I'm, I'm going to say when because data and, and polling is showing that recreational likely will pass. When recreational passes, if all of those 75 locations are taken sure. as part of the medical marijuana, sure. um, they're taken. And it doesn't open up opportunities for micro business Correct. because that's not allowed here. So potentially, potentially starting off more in the middle, allowing more locations just under the current plan, potentially could all of those spots could be taken by, as Commissioner Jones said, um, big cannabis, yeah. Yeah. who are already, as we all know, We've all been inundated by folks from Arizona and Colorado and Illinois and Indiana and Ohio. People are waiting, and they have a lot of money and they have a lot of cash on hand because this is an all-cash industry at this point mm -hmm. because they can't be banked. So, uh, so I just want to be really I want to be really clear for all of us if our intent is to try to support local, which we have heard loud and clear from this community right. that they want opportunity for micro businesses and local and minority-owned businesses. <laughs> That may not be an option for them unless we want to allow another 75 down the road and have over 150 potentially. Again, this is where the struggle is for us at this moment in time and feeling the pressure to make a decision. So I just, I want to, am I correct? I just want to make sure that my assumptions, I don't want to vote on something today that has an unintended consequence that a year from now we cannot fix because the cities that have opened up the floodgates and are now trying to rein it in, they are struggling and they're actively being sued. Yeah. So this is the this is the struggle that we are in right now. Okay. Right. Mary, I appreciate that because that that was that was the struggle in developing this ordinance uh, and trying to think of given. I mean, that's why I did that polarity diagram because <laughs> it was how do we how do we we heard loud and clear desires for small business opportunities and other things, and so that was why the micro business seemed to be attractive. If we're going to provide those local opportunities and allow a local, local economy to develop, um, and in my reading about California and why they created the micro business category, it was, and, and even in our own recreational language that's proposed for November, it was in response to big cannabis. Uh, and how do you do that? The, if we follow just the straight planning commission recommendation, big cannabis will have those spots and there's no guarantee of local investment. Um, and there are there's truly tens of millions of dollars in land transactions about to happen around this. I mean, this is not a thousand here. I mean, millions of dollars are going to be spent on land. And um, the one thing with the micro business was that you can't have ownership in any other type. Uh, so that would provide for a local economy to start to grow. And, and if I look at other examples in the country where they've embraced micro business and even in the intent of the people who drafted the recreational language, that was the direction they were headed in. So it's kind of outcome space is what are we trying to achieve based on that? And uh, if it's just access to marijuana, then I think the, you know, however number of sites that the, the city commission feels is, is needed, is, is warranted. If there are other outcomes beyond access to marijuana that include the equity considerations and possibility for small business startups, and building a local economy around, uh, similarly to what we've done with Beer City USA or microbreweries or micro distilleries, then I would recommend a different approach. All right, Commissioner O'Connor and then Commissioner well, Lanier. I, I, Mayor, I appreciate your comments on that. And I, I, the micro, I, the, the idea of a micro business is, is great, but if we looked at the recommendation for micro business, it was a thousand foot separation distance, right? And so I think part of my intent in offering up the, the Planning Commission that recommendation at 2,000 feet is to say, um, a, we do want them to exist in our tra traditional business corridors, but we're separating them further apart than even the recommendation for micro businesses. So even if a big player comes in, in the when we have that next conversation to Kurt's point about what does this look like when we know the finality of November, um, we're, we can re we could we can offer up a new category for micro businesses only in our zoning code that reduces that separation distance where they would still have to be X number of feet. We'll have time to find the data on. Well, can we put one mi additional micro business in between two of them that are 2,000 feet apart, which will leave a very small sliver of, of uh, space within our existing business corridors where they may exist. Um, I also think, to, to your point, when you're looking, at the, looking at the state rules to apply for these licenses, there are some, you know, outside of the, the hurdles that we can put up, there are some very significant hurdles from the Laura's perspective about financial resources that you have to prove. I mean, it's, it's any, any business like this, it's are very 
in depth, I think it's $250,000 net worth or something like that you have to have in order to be able to apply for one of these licenses. Um, so, um, and, and the, the access to, you have to have, have a property identified prior to your application to the state that's approved. So somebody has to have two. a purchase agreement, a, an option, or a, a lease in place, or a lease option in place on a particular parcel to make their application to the state, mm -hmm. and has to have gone through special land use at the city. So you're arguing that, so, so you're saying allow more now, but then if recreational passes and we're allowed to do micro, -brew, micro um, businesses, then allow more? No, no well, I mean, I, I think I'm saying allowing. It would reduce the requirements even more. So well, potentially I'm saying, the, yeah, I'm saying, could have concentrations. Well, yes and no. I mean, the, the micro business as approved in there, as proposed in the hybrid solution from the planning department is micro businesses 1,000 feet from each other. I'm saying require anything in our, and, and, and those are essentially uh, located in our traditional business corridors, the, the thousand foot separation um, for, for micro business. I'm saying if we're going to open up medical marijuana to traditional business corridors, we're setting it at 2,000 square feet, which is double what is being recommended for the micro businesses. So I still think there's opportunity in the future. I mean, if a thousand foot is the distance, then um, I think that, that we have the ability to make that, that change in the future and we can look at what sites are available because if six months from now, this becomes uh, our, our, our rule. We'll know what exists, and we'll have data to say, hey, I think there's an opportunity on Cherry Street to have one. There's an opportunity on Plainfield to have one in this location because it meets. I mean, we, and then you can adjust it to not just have to be 1,000 feet. It could be 1,500 feet. It could be yeah. 1,287 feet if that's what we need to do to make sure we can pick out the pockets where they could exist well. And I think, and again, 2,000 square feet, 2,000 feet, looking at West Leonard, it is 5,000 feet from the highway to Valley Street in that commercial section of the street, you're really only going to get two in that whole section depending upon where they locate. Well, I think that's why it would be nice to have that broken down with the map sure. because yeah. we're making assumptions right now about what that looks like and we could all be wrong. Uh, I measured it. The, the number two, um, <laughs> the hybrid approach assumed the 1,000 multi-jurisdictional buffer. So that number would go up uh, if that buffer was eliminated. Right, okay. All right, commissioners. I want to get a, get a sense of where we are because we still have two more items on our on our agenda. We have public safety at twelve thirty. Uh, at eleven thirty, mayor. So we have. I don't know, commissioner Jones. Was anybody present? Yeah. Well, we yeah we have. Uh, it's been it's been handled by uh, Asante. Asante. Yeah. Okay. So we're all set. We're good. Okay. We're good. Okay. Um, so, uh, so let me get a sense of of where the commission is on this. So the the what's before us right now is planning commission recommendations. There have been a couple, uh, sounds like, agreement on some of the changes and amendments. So what I'm hearing is support of $5,000 annual fee. Um, I heard mixed about Vita's um, interest in looking at a 2,000-foot two, buffer. Um, Commissioner O'Connor also brought up allowing the Planning Commission to provide waivers. Uh, personally, I'm not supportive of that at this point. Um, I, after her explanation, I'm not as concerned about it. I just okay. was trying to understand the rationale. I'm not trying to, I'm not, I wasn't making okay. that regularly. I just wanted to understand if, why it was there and why it, okay. uh, if it was in anything else. All right. So, um, commissioners, thought, any additional thoughts on that? Um, I, I'll entertain an amendment and then we can vote on the, on the amended recommendation if you'd like. Um, it would be nice to kind of know where everyone is. Uh, Commissioner Lanier. Um So, I think Commissioner O'Connor will probably be great if, I, I'm assuming everyone has the same mm -hmm. chart that I have with um, the three options in front of us. And since what's on the floor is the Planning Commission's recommendation, I think it would be great if you would step by step, so even starting at the review process yep. and the five boxes that are up there, kind of walk through all of those. Um, just so that I'm clear on what it is that you're proposing in your amendments. I have kind of captured mm -hmm. what I was hearing from um, all of you just to make sure that I'm understanding what's also being considered. But there are a couple other things so that I wanted to mention. So the Vita, I think, is extremely valuable. Um, and especially in, in areas where... Um, we don't have SIDS and BIDS present. I think it's going to be extremely valuable to make sure the Good Neighbor Plan and the VITA are a part of those. 
Um, I think the other thing, so so the tax revenue, we really haven't talked about the tax revenue. So we've talked about the annual fee, which is one thing. Um, and I actually think that, Suzanne, you're right in that administratively, you're going to have a lot of work to do in your department. So I think it's important to keep the annual fee in, but I think ultimately that annual fee is probably going to stay within the planning department in order for you to administer um, administer this properly. But we haven't talked a lot, or today at all, about um, tax revenue. And so um, Commissioner Kelly had the um, suggestion, as we've been kind of talking about lead in our community and, and ways to abate that, you know, what creative ways do we have um, with the tax revenue to, to address these huge issues we have in our community? This isn't obviously tied directly to um, this industry, but because there, this is a new tax source, you know, how can we leverage that to address other woes that we're having across the city? So I'd like us to look at that as much as we can just to kind of see, you know, what we can do with that. But I also think it's important to make sure that um, the, there's um, prevention, dollars for prevention for youth. So, you know, how do we, and maybe that's tied to some of this annual fee piece, or maybe that's tied to, to the tax revenue. How do we? Can you explain the money that the state is required to give back from their licensing fees? I know that there's some of that to that goes to local to, yeah. law enforcement. Unfortunately, it's to the county, not to the city. But I think there's some, where do those other funds go? I just, I, that's and a good clarification. I, that might, I don't, that might address. It does, and I think that's a good point because I think we also need to talk about the county. Thank you, Commissioner Womack, for being present so that you can kind of hear what we're thinking because the, the county themselves will generate dollars from this industry. And maybe there's a way to partner with the county because the Kent County Prevention Coalition is a county initiative. And so that may be another way to, to where we get those funds from to address some of the things, the unintended consequences that may arise. And I think also pooling dollars for what Commissioner Jones has suggested, which was a sliding scale fee. Um, for um, local businesses who may not have the resources to, to get involved. So, yeah, Susan, can you speak to that? Because we've heard, you know, some people keep saying, you know, we need to do this because there's a ton of money associated with it and it's going to increase our revenues. Now, the, there's a clear distinction between funds that come back to us under medical marijuana versus if recreational passes. Correct. And, and they're dramatically different. Mm -hmm. And so um, I think we need to be mindful that this isn't going to be, as some have said, a windfall for our city to do with what we will. Uh, so can you explain that? Yep. Under uh, the Medical Marijuana Facilities Licensing Act, uh, they, they collect 3% um, of the provisioning center's gross retail receipts. Um, and so then that's dispersed uh, as follows. 25% to municip municipalities in which a marijuana facility is located, allocated in proportion to the number of marijuana facilities within the municipality. 30% to counties in which a marijuana facility is located. 5% to counties uh, allocated, hang on, exclusively to support the county sheriff's department. 30% to the state for deposit in the first responder presumed coverage fund, 5% to the Michigan Commission on Law Enforcement Standards, and 5% to the Department of State Police. If uh, recreational passes the way that they have it until, uh, the wording is until 2022 for at least two years, uh, 20 million uh, must be provided annually to one or more clinical trials approved by the U.S. Food and Drug Administration around marijuana. Uh, including suicide prevention, and then um, then it's going to be allocated as followed uh, in a different formula than what I just read. 15% to municipalities in which a marijuana retail store or marijuana micro business is located. 15% to counties. 35% to the school aid fund for K-12 education, and 35% to the Michigan Transportation Fund for roads and bridges. So there Thank you. All right. Was that clear? Mm -hmm. Okay, Commissioner. Uh, well, yeah. can I ask a follow-up before we? Mm -hmm. So, Suzanne, so can you have you researched yet um, local communities like Lansing and what what types of revenue they've received through this process? I'm just thinking of anybody local in the state of Michigan who's already 
a part of the uh, medical marijuana industry. Can we get numbers to? They just gave out the first ten I licenses, they... so, it's, so it's so early to tell. Oh, okay. So not having the They're not. They're not collected. They're just oh, starting to license the facilities to start okay. to collect. Yeah. 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 Commissioner Kelly. Yeah, I just wanted to elaborate on this um, this issue about collecting income tax because there will be, you know, just like we have um, done with our affordable housing, we set aside, we, we always estimate if we do incentives how much income tax is going to come in, so we're setting that aside for affordable housing. So in this case, I know Commissioner Lanier has been for months working with the county co coalition around uh, this issue of lead, and we know that, for example, in 49507, we've got a lot of a lot of problems with lead and that it's like a 20-year fix it's going to take a lot of money so uh, to Commissioner Jones's comments earlier about uh, who has been harmed because of drug laws I think that this would be a way to consider how to repair some of that ha harm and to have a benefit for our children who are suffering from lead so it's just a consideration and hopefully it would be something that um, the county would partner with us on because there will be revenue coming in too and I know that <coughs> I appreciate your being here too, Commissioner Womack, because I think that um, we should be talking to all of our county commissioners, particularly all of them, but particularly those who serve the city of Grand Rapids, because this is our largest population center. But we do have flood issues throughout the entire county, and this might be a way to begin to address that. So just something to put on the, on the table um, in terms of how we we use this revenue in order to get at some of the goals that we are we're after. Well, and commissioners, there's a, there's a number of issues, and, and if we go back to Suzanne's chart about timeline, there are a number of things that we, if we pass this today, there are a number of things that we still need to work through, including the VITA and the Good Neighbor Plan, and, um, you know, if we want to put in requirements around um, getting recommendations or support from SIDS or BIDS or neighborhoods, um, what to do with the revenue generated, if, in fact, there will be any before, Recreational potentially kicks in, okay. so I, I, this is this is really the the land use issue, uh, and then we know that there are going to be a number of issues that have to come back before us, either in the form of resolution or policy or additional ordinances. Yes. So, and so that will be one of the um, mm -hmm. items on our long laundry list of items that we're going to have to work through. Correct. So, so. Um, okay, commissioners, any other questions related to the uh, recommendation at hand? So as we go back to, you want me to run through my list? Correction. I'd like to make sure that I have. I know what I'm providing for you. Why don't we today. go through each item individually? So uh, why don't we? Why don't we make each amendment? One amendment at a time. Yeah. Okay. So I guess yeah. I'll, I'll start with the uh, amendment to uh, reinstate the five thousand dollar annual fee. Okay, so the amendment on the table is to um, reenact or reinstate the five thousand dollar annual fee. Is there a support? Yes, support. Okay, all those in favor of that amendment, say aye. 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 Okay. Uh, my second amendment would be to uh, for the pla the provisioning centers to uh, increase it from one thousand feet from another facility to two thousand feet from another facility. All right. Support. Okay. okay, commissioners, questions about that amendment? Be really nice to have a map of that personally. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. we can I like it better than a thousand feet. Right. But. All right. Any other questions about that? All right. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? All right. Um, to your point, Mayor, about the 600 feet f or, uh, for the other facilities, I mean, I think to Suzanne's point, 2,000 is probably too far because they are industrial uses, but if you would, I, I would be open to amending that to maybe a thousand feet. Um, so it's consistent with the other setbacks. Um, so we only have two setbacks that, are, that we're considering: 2,000 feet for provisioning centers and 1,000 feet for everything else. I think that's a that's a fair amendment. So I would make that amendment to 1,000 feet for all other medical marijuana facilities. All right, Commissioner, is there support? Support. All right. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Okay. Those opposed, it carries. Uh, I would make an amendment to uh, remove the language from uh, five. Point nine point one nine uh, <laughs> regarding serious objectionable characteristics. Mm -hmm. All right. Is there support? A support. Okay. Questions, comments? All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? What was that section again? Uh, 5.9.19 mm -hmm. marijuana facilities. Yep. I think that is all. 
Um, did someone might want to make uh, an amendment for Vita? To include uh, Vita? I would like to do that. Mm -hmm. I'd like to include Vita. Could it? All right. Is there support? Support. support. Okay. Any questions or comments? Yeah, I, I mean, I wanted to just argue against that a little bit. Um, <laughs> I, I think the idea of a Vita is, again, singling out a particular industry which we've never done before and so as we have a conversation about vitas in our community when we had the initial conversation they were set aside for very large projects there's an additional fee that's tied to a vita so if we want to talk about small business opportunity and development to require a, 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 a small business to have to spend an additional twenty three hundred dollar fee to get a vita to go through the uh, very cumbersome and in, 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 in I mean, we're talking about inst institutions having essentially to be part of the Vita originally, and now we're talking about s small bit players and neighborhood businesses to have to manage that same system. I think that's going to add a significant amount of burden. I, I mean, the good neighbor plan is is very good, but I don't think the Vita has place in again singling out a particular industry as well as if we're genuinely talking about supporting locally owned businesses. I don't necessarily agree with that. Um, I'll do Commissioner Lanier's and Commissioner Kelly. So, Suzanne, is there room for adjusting the fee for the VITA? I think, I mean, you're going to be opening up the VITA policy as part of your discussion. That's where you set the fee for that and how the VITA works and how you look at it for um, marijuana businesses. I think that's up to you guys from a policy standpoint. That, that's all yours. Yeah. So, um, it's a voluntary agreement. So, however you want to structure that, I mean, within the bounds of what legally you can do. I think that, that'll be a discussion with Jessica and, and legal and staff. within that policy, we could have a, a subsection specifically for marijuana facilities. That's, that's what I would anticipate. Okay. Commissioner Kelly? I, I was going to ask the same question, so we'll be able to look at that more closely later on. Yes. Um, Commissioner Jones, did you have a comment about that? No. Okay. And this is similar to um, the language that Pontiac is using around community benefits? Yes, it's similar to Avita, and that's where they've integrated in some of the commitment to local. That's they were doing it through community benefits agreement. Okay. Yes. All right. Any questions about that? All right. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Those opposed? Yeah. Aye. It carries. All right. Any other recommended amendments to this, Commissioner? Um. Um. I'm sorry. <laughs> I got thrown off. <laughs> So, so I'm looking at the two, and Mayor, maybe I'm going about this wrong because we're in the process of trying to amend, but I'm looking at the two areas where we've struck the language for um, substance abuse clinics, rehabs. I've heard from a number of, of institutions who are in the, the business in our community of, you know, rehabilitation um, from clergy. And so I think adding the 1,000 feet um, so the language for both provision, provisioning centers as well as the others. So I would want that in for all of them, um, which is language that came from the planning director's recommendation. So you want to make an amendment for the 1,000 feet uh, from substance abuse clinics or rehabilitation facilities? And Yeah, the parks, yeah, all of that Park, language. Park, playground, yeah. church, mm -hmm. place of worship, substance abuse clinic or rehab, mm -hmm. but not the um, adjacent jurisdictions, correct? Correct. Okay. So um, so do you want to make the motion for that? Just read, maybe read the top section and leave out the, the adjacent facility boundary. Okay. So I'll make the motion to, and it's weird that it's written differently for provisional and the oh, medical center. So I'll read this section that's under medical marijuana, the all other medical marijuana facilities. Um, I'd like to make a motion to amend the section and include 1,000 feet from publicly owned park or playground, church or place of worship, substance abuse clinic, or rehabilitation facility. Um, yeah. All right. Okay. So that's the recommended amendment. Is there support for that? And I don't have a colleague here, so somebody better get my motion on the floor. <laughs> <laughs> so is there support for that motion? <laughs> so moved. So you, there was a motion <laughs> and support. So what's before us is adding back in the language related to a thousand foot buffer from church, uh, place of worship, substance abuse clinic, or rehab facility, and then for the medical marijuana facilities, the um, publicly owned Parker playground. Uh, and I'll start with uh, Commissioner O'Connor and then Commissioner Kelly. And I get your concern. I'm, I'm just, again, I think if, if that's going to go back in, there needs to be a mechanism for, I mean, again, 
Commissioner Kelly talked about alcohol. Alcohol is only 500 feet from church or place of worship, mm -hmm. uh, and it allows the <clears throat> user, owner of that facility, the ability to waive that right to allow it to exist. And I so, I agree. Yep, okay, I agree. Yeah, I, I, um, yep. I actually would support it as well with that caveat mm -hmm. to allow the the church or the school. To my my only other question is the publicly owned park or playground. What is the mechanism for <laughs> this institution? Since we own most of the parks and playgrounds except for the schools, uh, you know. And again, Congress Elementary was an example of a school on property. Like, what is the mechanism to ensure that to allow that to happen? I don't. That's why I think it's really important that neighborhoods have a voice and mm -hmm. can weigh in on that. Right, but I mean, how 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 does it how do if if someone wants to open a facility and it's a thousand feet from it's five hundred feet from Garfield Park? How do we? Who makes the decision? Is it the neighborhood? Is it this body? Is it the parks department chair? Is it the planning department? Like who who yeah. ultimately does that decision fall to, to, think, to, to provide the way? I think we have wave? to decide. We're flying by the seat of our pants. I know. Going on. <laughs> That's what I'm just asking. I'm just trying to talk we'll through figure it. figure it out. Yeah. <laughs> I would say if it's a formal we'll approval, that would probably be the city commission. That's what I would say. Okay. You, you give approvals for use of property. I thought. Right. Right. You know. Commissioner Lanier, would you like to am amend your amendment and add the caveat uh, that the church or school or facility could waive that requirement. With a waiver, uh, so what my motion already was, Mr. Clerk, <laughs> in addition to a waiver um, option for the facility. Okay, can I, and Listed. Mr. Jones, will you support that? I do, support. Okay, mm -hmm. so that's the amendment on, on, is putting the thousand feet back in with uh, the uh, facility being able to waive that requirement. Commissioner? Um, I just want to talk about this versus the 500 feet that that's alcohol. Um, I, I'm happy that the waiver's back in, but having read the um, information and done the study, I'm I'm actually more concerned about um, alcohol than marijuana in terms of effects. You know, people people who may be getting rehabilitated for opioid abuse might right. be better off switching to uh, drugs that they're using, and and you just don't have the same sort of um, physical reaction that you do with alcohol. I mean, I, I've never heard of people dying from a uh, marijuana overdose. You hear that with alcohol. You don't have, um, you know, we have Alcoholics Anonymous. I mean, there are other issues that come with it, and I'm more, most concerned about children. But um, I just don't know that it's, it's necessary to have a 1,000 feet. I think it is important to have the waiver so that people can talk about it in their community. Any any other comments, Commissioner? Uh, my rebuttal to that, Commissioner, would simply be just like I said to my colleague to my right. I think we're moving too rapidly, and I think let's start with this language. And in the event that we need to make some adjustments, then we can make some adjustments. Yeah, I appreciate that. It yeah, it's fine. And I th I think that is what resonates with me is that we can set these today, and I and I think many of us have said this throughout this entire process. Let's start with something that is thoughtful and balanced that addresses the concerns that our neighbors have, yep. and then we can amend it down the road. Um, and we can, once we have a little bit of experience on our, under our belt, we can revisit some of these requirements and adjust them. And I'm, I'm fine with that. I, I, of course, we've all probably read a lot of articles, but it was interesting because uh, medical marijuana dispensaries have been in Ann Arbor since 1996, and they are now amending theirs from um, six, 600 feet distance to a thousand because they're saying the same thing that people need to to see how it's working transition where this is kind of this going to be a shock to our community as it is yeah and ann arbor my understanding is that they're still under moratorium mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. they haven't lifted that they're right. still working on it because of the struggles they're having right so okay so, so the motion at hand just so Suzanne is following us, for both, <laughs> for, both, um, for both the provisioning center and the medical marijuana facilities to add back in the 1,000 feet for the facilities other than the adjacent jurisdictions with the caveat that those facilities can waive the, the requirement. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Nope. So, commissioners, that is what I'm going to call a vote on is that amendment. Um, all those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? It carries. Okay. Uh, can we add uh, the same waiver then in uh, for the thousand feet from child care center public private school? I think that's in, in state law. 
They have, well, th we, there's several issues. One, there's drug-free school zones and whether or not that applies because that's a federal thing. So that requires 1,000 feet. Um, and then the recreational, I mean, I know that's future, but that also requires 1,000 feet. But the local jurisdictions can waive that. So um, I think that's a potential future okay. change. But I think to be on the safe side, I would recommend keeping 1,000 for schools. That's fine. Yeah. So the only other one that we haven't talked about is the buffer from residential zones that was um, removed. Uh, any any questions or comments on that? Any? Leave yeah, it. I'd, I'd like to make a motion just to have the conversation because I don't think we've talked about this option at all um, today. So I'd make a motion to add back in the 250 foot um, res residential zone district um, distance buffer. Yes, on all provision provisioning as well as the other facilities and licenses. Is there support for that? I'll support it even though I don't agree with it. Okay. <laughs> Just so we can have the conversation. So nice. <laughs> um, and, and I think that the, the reason that that has been removed is that it, that is the mechanism that allows it to exist in TBA. Right. Be, if, as soon as you put the 250 foot from residential into the zoning code, because lots along Wealthy Street, Cherry Street, Leonard Street, Bridge Street are 150 feet deep, mm -hmm. they, they then are adjacent to a residential zone district. So to allow provisioning centers to exist in traditional business corridors, that is why that. But, but I thought, Suzanne, that um, in one of the maps that we, ha we did have some of the properties in Resid in the local kind of yes, residential the micro business, business one in the micro business pulls out the re the residential distance requirement if you like yeah. it. it pulled out the residential. So it's only in those that we would have them. So another alternative that uh, Commissioner O'Connor had proposed in the past around alcohol was that if it was measured along the frontage of the street mm -hmm. rather than oh. the radius, so that might be another option. And the other thing to look at, commissioners, is. Uh, putting it in for one and not the other. I mean, if it's if it's really wanting to ensure that there's opportunities in a TBA, that'd be a provisioning center, but do we want to protect residential neighborhoods from the larger potential grow facilities and testing or 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 maybe not. I mean, right. it's it's probably less likely that you have next to an industrial space a residential neighborhood, right. although there are some, there are some in the um, third ward especially. So. Yeah, that's right. So Suzanne, if if it was there um, with the distance being from the front, how does that impact the options? And I think that, and I don't know if you'll have time between now and tonight to be able to kind of put maps together or something together so we can have number, the estimate to be a little bit you know, more clear of what this all will mean, but it'll be great to see all of this in practice um, by this evening. So, so you may not know this off the top of your head, but I'm just curious to know if you think the frontage would make adding that in there would if that would make a difference um, it would help in those shallower areas where Commissioner O'Connor mentioned that they may only be a hundred or 150 feet deep that usually you have an alley but it would be excluded the next street behind would be excluded from that 250 foot buffer if you follow the linear front footage um, because we're not doing a whole radius around the site. So it allows for the frontage to be developed, but what it would do is that on the edges of the district, mm -hmm. then you're talking you have to be 250 feet in um, if you're doing that. I don't know if these maps help. I'll no. use your language, thank you, well, well, But I was going to say, I would, I would say I'd be open to using the front footage, but make it consistent with the 1,000 feet that we're using in the other. So I think one of the, like Fulton Street's a good example where there's, some commercial, there's some residential, there's some commercial, there's a couple nodes of commercial. Mm -hmm. So just ensuring that they're far, the, the uses the are far enough, enough from apart. the, where there's a pretty sizable pocket of uh, residential homes that exist. Just, well, you got me at a thousand feet. You do a thousand feet, I'll support that. Absolutely. So I'm going to amend my motion. Okay, <laughs> let's hear it. Can we move and start over? Yeah, I think I will. Okay, Let me do that. Why don't you do that? Withdraw your motion. I'm withdrawing my last motion. Okay, so motion um, withdrawn. And Commissioner Arlena, you want to make another motion? I'm going to make a motion to add in for all facilities um, a thousand feet from residential zone districts, a thousand linear feet. Thank you. For right, me. linear or frontage? Frontage okay. for residential zone, residential zone districts. Support. Okay, so commissioners, any 
And that does provide a buffer from a block that is residential that's right next to a block that's commercial. Yes. Yeah. Right. Okay. Any any other questions or comments about that? Good. Okay. All right. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Okay. Any other amendments? And then I'm going to call the question on the um, entire amended recommendation. Right, City Attorney? Am I getting this right? Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. <laughs> so, pull on my Roberts rules. <laughs> oh my Commissioner goodness. Kelly? Yeah. I, I just want to say again, thank you. Yeah. And sorry. <laughs> because this has been so crazy, so difficult. And I also want to thank the Planning Commission me members. I mean, and I'm happy, I mean, we have to keep in mind that they kept in mind this is about medical marijuana. This is what we're voting on now. Right. But we also recognize what's coming down the pike. So uh, we're doing our best to, it looks like we're going to land with, um, well, we'll see what the numbers are. Okay. I don't even speak to that, but in a pretty good place. Okay. I, I have one question. Um, I, because in the hybrid language, I did not mention, I, meant, I mentioned marijuana, but not medical marijuana. Do you want medical added back in? At this point, that's the only thing that's legal in our state. Yeah. So I think it's fine leaving it as is, quite frankly. Deal with that. I'm saying it's not in currently. Medical is not currently yeah, in Yeah, I don't language. think it needs to be. That's my opinion. That's the only oh, type because of marijuana the state already, that's legal you know in our talking. state. Okay. So to okay. me, it's... Okay, point. thank you. It's a, yeah, it's a new point. Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, at this point, that's the only thing that we can regulate. So. Okay. Um, okay, so can I ask... Um, Commissioner, will you make the motion for the? Here, here oh, I already have it. Yeah, so, so on the floor so is the. Made the motion. Rupert seconded the. Ordinance. All of the amendments were with, with added. The, with the planning commission's recommendations, and these are the changes. Mm -hmm. from yeah. The so um, I'm going to call the question for the fully amended recommendation. Um, all those in favor, say aye. 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 Those opposed. It carries. So Suzanne, I know we have a really busy day, but if you can get us a clean copy of what we just talked about over the last <laughs> couple of hours, and uh, maybe do some initial uh, numbers and mapping so yeah. that we can have that in front of us tonight mm -hmm. um, when we discuss this again and cast our final vote. And again, commissioners, uh, one, I just appreciate all the work all of us have put into this. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> and I, I wanna reiterate, what so many of us have said. This is a starting point. We can amend it down the road based on our learning. Uh, and, and we know that we're gonna continue to have work to do, not just likely on this, but also come November if the recreational passes. Um, and then we'll be able to take a deeper dive into this opportunity around micro business. Mayor, is it possible for us to, um, and I know we're you know tapped out on this discussion, but to have a work session to kind of talk through all of these other kind of ancillary things, yeah. like the fee for the Vita, like, yes. you know, how do we, Absolutely. yeah, the incentives, what do we do yes. with the tax revenue, all of that. Yes, why don't we, um, yes, we will. Uh, I know Suzanne, I think, has a vacation coming up, <laughs> and I know we have multiple other work sessions, and we are in the process of hiring a new city manager, so why don't we look to late August or the 1st of September to have that, especially since this language um, doesn't go into effect until October. Yep. Okay. Thank you. That, that was going to be my one question is if you wanted all the, I was going to try to pull up the timeline, if you wanted all of the facilities to start on October 1 where we would start accepting applications or did you want <coughs> to have that date moved? To November 1? To, to a later date. I don't, it's up to you. Commissioners? Can we decide in, in September when we meet? Well, I think as have soon as we session? make, I think as soon as we vote tonight, yeah. Suzanne's office is going to be inundated tomorrow. Well, I think that's going to happen regardless. But they're going to want to know a start date. We have to. We have to figure out. I mean, they're in talking with the other jurisdictions, the logistics of the initial intake, and how you process that, and how you have the number of requests, is um, interesting. I mean, it depends on whether or not you want lines out your door and people spending the night camping, so that they're the first ones in with the applications. I mean, there's lots of things to think about, and the scope of what that was. If we were dealing with 208 sites versus 2,600 sites. That's our locations. That's a it's a big difference on how we manage the logistics of that. So, um, just knowing what that date would be would be helpful from a planning perspective. So, so, so Suzanne, what 
what are you recommending? Because you know your your staff, your and you know what you all have going on. Are you comfortable with the October first? And could we in in September during the work session change that date in the event that you're feeling overwhelmed and not prepared? You could. I think um, partly it depends on how you want to have. If you want to have the Vita stuff in place, and if the tax receipts, I think you have a little bit of a lag in there because we still have lag with Lara giving their licensing. Mm -hmm. So um, we could we could try for that and extend it out, but we want to. I just want to make sure that you're comfortable with the V because they're part of their application requirement is to submit if they're going to submit a VITA, that is submitted as part of their planning commission application. So if we if we make a, a decision on the VITA during the work session in September, you could still implement it in October. We could. So, I mean, do you feel staff-wise that you're prepared for an October 1st start date? Be honest. I mean, I, I, feel, you need to I would honest. feel better about November, but I mean, maybe we could do mid-October. I and mean, I we, could, I, we could I pick a couple make it later. November. Yeah, let's do November 1. Okay. A 30-day difference yeah. is probably more valuable to um, your department than to the folks who are interested in opening that place. I think the concern is making sure that we have it all processed qu correctly and we're setting up our Excel system and how we're going to do intake and even uh, planning commission protocols on how they set their agendas. So we've been in contact with Tom Forshee in the attorney's office because we wanted to make sure that there's room for other development requests <coughs> reserved on the planning commission agenda so it's not all marijuana requests. So there's, and then even Battle Creek, when they have approvals given, they update daily their marijuana facilities map so they know as soon as you pick one location, it bumps out other locations because of the separation distance. So just being able to be set up correctly so that we have real-time data available for the industry and that we can really uh, facilitate the process well, I, I would appreciate the additional time. Okay. Then let's change that to November 1. That's that's not in the ordinance, is it? There's a receipt of applications portion in the ordinance, and I will amend that. Okay. Do we need a formal amendment? That's so what, that's why. That's why so that's why you're asking. Do you want to make that amendment? Yep. Absolutely. So that is section. Hold on. Well, while you're looking it up, I'll make the amendment to change the effective date from October 1, 20 ap effective date of, applic of application receipt, Suzanne from October 1st, 2018 to November 1st, 2018. Support. Support. All right, all those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Thank you. So it's section 5.9.19, part M. All right, well, thank you. Sorry, I'm the lawyer. Right, I, got a, I got a for, muffin. We both, we're fighting for space. <laughs> oh no, go okay, ahead. all right, attorneys. You go uh, first. So yeah. the provision that Suzanne pointed out was, dire was legislative directing when staff was to accept applications, which is a different question from when the effective date of the act goes into play. So for clarity, for our sake, mm -hmm. um, if you make a motion for immediate consideration of the ordinance, it's gonna be like 10 days, don't do that. <sighs> Sorry. Um, so um, if, if you vote for immediate effect for the ordinance, the ordinance would take effect in approximately 10 days. If you just do normal procedures and do not provide a specific, this ordinance shall take effect on whatever, um, then it's a new, normally a 30-day window. Um, you can also delay the effective date of the ordinance, or you can have the 30-day normal date and just direct us when to start accepting applications. I'll add the effect, a change to the effective date. So I'll make a motion to change the effective date to November 1st of 2018. All right. Squirt. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? It carries. One quick question before you both leave. All right. City Attorney. That'll be quick. No, go ahead. Um, because I don't have my notes and I don't want it to get missed. Do we need to do a separate ordinance to opt in? No. I don't think so. I don't think we do. No, I mean, because we've... I don't think we do because effectively we'll have created the, the scheme to do that. So I, I think we'll be all right. Yeah. We, we do have to give Lara notice um, and, that, and that also has to be submitted with applications, but we will double okay. check that for this evening. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Yeah, it's administrative, correct? If I remember, you, your office does that. Yes. Okay. okay. All right, commissioners, so we have two more items. I want to make sure Art's still here. Art, I have one more action item and then I'll call you up. Um, <laughs> so our next uh, item, resolution awarding a contract with Davis Construction for pretreatment system improvements at the Lake Michigan Filtration Plant. Uh, Mayor, I vote to a resolution awarding a contract with Triangle Associates Incorporated for the pretreatment system at Lake Michigan Drive, Lake Michigan Filtration Plant. 
right, is there support for that? So the um, commissioner is making a motion to support um, giving the contract to Triangle. Support. Support. So that is what's on the table right now. Uh, Commissioner O'Connor, you want to? The Triangle was the low bidder, and I just believe that they uh, have done the diligence to be awarded the contract. Okay. Commissioners, other thoughts? Commissioner Kelly? Um, I disagree. I think that this should be awarded to Davis. I think that the staff did a good job, and, and I'm especially um, concerned about um, the work that uh, Franklin Howard would be doing. They've done a lot of work for the city over many, many years. That we've, they've been dependable. And this is a huge contract. I also had some concerns, actually, about um, Triangle reaching out to us when there was a, a conflict. I mean, it's, it's one thing to talk to uh, a vendor ahead of time who's interested in um, educating us. It's a whole other thing for um, us to be contacted to talk about a conflict when there's a bid out there. I actually contacted the city attorney and asked for advice about that because I didn't want to be in a position. First of all, I'm not an expert on all of this. That's why we rely on staff. And secondly, if if there, when there's a conflict, sometimes it winds up in a lawsuit. So I just wanted to be very, very cautious uh, and not find myself saying something to someone that could later be um, used. You know, I'd have to to have a de be deposed in a lawsuit, for example. So I just I just felt uncomfortable with that. But um, I just I feel like the, the difference was so very slight, and uh, in the context of 13 million dollars, I really believe that we need to um, to go with companies that we've worked with before where we haven't had problems. I also understand that there were some um, there was a. a a meeting with staff, and that, as it turned out, the uh, the, the companies Davis and um, and Triangle felt that the process actually was was well done. There were some other issues, but um, so I appreciate staff having done that at our request. So I am comfortable with Davis, and I think that's who should get this contract. Okay, Commissioner Park. Yeah. So I, uh, you know, first I just want to say that I believe wholeheartedly that our staff acted with integrity and I think that our process is good and really we are talking about a, a really close margin and the reason why it's close though is because they got uh, a discount for working with Mason Rock Contracting, Roque Viegas, you know, it's, he's, he would, th this would give his company, and that's not a lot of money, but it's $153,000 to a Latino owned business and uh, that's the reason why we had that in there is so that it would give people that edge. And what I learned about this process that I think is interesting is we base a contractor's ability to do something by their previous body of work. So this gives Roque and his crew a $150,000 contract that they can use in the future to justify their, their uh, ability to bid on even bigger contracts. So I think that you know, and I also think, you know, Davis has a local presence, but Triangle is, is truly local. And uh, they did take a risk um, in reaching out, and I respect that. And I think that they're determined to prove that, that they would do the right thing um, afterwards. But for me, it really comes down to, I want that $153,000 to go into the pocket of, of Mason Rock Contracting. And that's, that's the reason why they got the lowest bid. And so I respect that part of our process. But I, I do want to say that I... I believe that our staff acted with absolute integrity. Um. All right, uh, Commissioner Liner and then Commissioner Jones. Uh, I agree 100% with everything Commissioner Ruppert stated. Um, I am curious though, one of the things that we wanted to get to come out of this discussion is making sure that the process that we have is less subjective. So I'm curious to know how those conversations have gone. Um, Mr. Monte, I know I think you and or members from your team had been involved in that. So I'm curious to know, to have an update on that. Um, so if you'd like to share that now. Sure, and we had an opportunity to meet. I, I see many of them here. And I want to say thank you for uh, working with the staff. I do want to say before I answer the question, the staff uh, followed the process and we are all, we are concurrent that that's the case. This is a difference of the outcome of that process. In those conversations, we agreed to work within the Monday group to review the process to see if there are areas where we can improve. I think one area that was identified is how do we deal with uh, subs, uh, the time of uh, the meetings that we have. So that will be an area that we will be having conversation with the Monday group. I'm very eager to have those conversations because I think it's just like any other process. 
Um, these are opportunities where we can step back and see how can we improve, and, uh, and I'm eager to have those conversations with them. Thank you. And then a follow-up question is, it's my understanding that at some point um, the subcontractor that um, staff had um, concerns about, that they had been recently approved for more dollars, well, to, to qualify, pre-qualify pre for more, for contracts that were of a um, greater cost. So I'm curious to know um, if, the, if we had made that decision outside of this particular bid, um, then what logic did we use to then indicate that there were concerns about whether that same um, subcontractor had the capability of handling the level of the contract that we have pre-qualified them? To I'm going to have Jeff. Jeff, if you want to respond to the process that we use, and then I can follow up. Thank you. Sure. Um, good afternoon, uh, Mayor and Commissioners. Um, our pre-qualification process does require subcontractors um, to be pre-qualified at the time of bid if the subcontracted amount is $10,000 or more. Um, in this case, uh, DHE was formerly pre-qualified um, with the city for $2.5 million. Um, that lapsed, I believe it was December 31st of 2013. Um, the policy does allow us to um, accept applications afterwards. Um, it is at the bidder's risk that the, the sub will become pre-qualified. So uh, typically our practice is if it's um, that we do allow these after the fact. Um, we did review their experience and um, they actually received pretty good references. Uh, their, it, it's based on their company's finances and their company's finances were um, you know, very good. Um, the, the, the references for their larger projects tended to be in the um, educational field and also um, commercial type work and they really had very few um, references in the water, wastewater type projects. So um, their list I think for water and wastewater included only three projects in the $600,000 range to $800,000 range. But Jeff, just to clarify though <clears throat> and follow up to Commissioner Lanier's question because this is a, a point of concern for me. Uh, we did pre-qualify DHE for up to six million, and so when the the triangle presented their bid, they were under the impression that we had pre-qualified their subcontractor for up to six million. Correct. I mean, they, they were operating under the presumption that because of the approved pre-qualification, that that was an appropriate subcontractor. Uh, well. Actually, at the time of bid, DHE was not pre-qualified. The application for their increase or actually to become re-pre-qualified didn't come in until after the bids were received. So at the time of bid, DHE was not pre-qualified with the city. But then we accepted it once we pre-qualified them as a part of the bid. I mean, the pre-qualification, once you're pre-qualified, it, it used to be it was good for 12 months. Um, currently, now that we've went to more of an online system, once you're pre-qualified, um, it's, it's really indefinitely or until things change or you want to request an increase or we become aware of circumstances where it should be decreased or maybe a category should be, be removed or added. But Mayor, um, so the question is not if they were pre-qualified or not, is staff had the opportunity to review every company and at the time of review, the level of experience of one company or one sub was lower than another sub. And that's how they're basing that recommendation. So yes, they were both pre-qualified based on being able to do projects at that amount of dollars. But once they review, uh, and that's one of the areas that we're going to have conversation when we meet with the Monday group is at what point do we want to review all of the subs to provide the prime we had assurance that for that type of project, that sub can actually perform and there are no concerns. Okay. And then one last question, Mayor. So, um, so during the interview phase, um, so when, when there were conversations with the contractors, was the concern brought forth um, with DHE to Triangle when they came for their interview? I don't know what you all call it, but... Yeah, a time. post bid interview. Okay. Um, they, they were, DHE actually did not attend the post bid interview with Triangle. Mm -hmm. um, the other team, Davis, did bring Franklin Howard to their interview. Um, the, but were there any concerns um, shared with Triangle regarding DHE, whether they were present or not? 
Um, not to my knowledge. I think okay. the you know the experience lists were provided after the interview, I believe. So. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else? Yep, yep. I, uh, I too, I'm joining my colleague, uh, Commissioner Kelly, in supporting the contract um, going to uh, Davis. Um, I think I would uh, probably lean toward um, supporting uh, Triangle if this were just a traditional construction project. But I think when we're talking about um, the fact that it has everything to do with, the, with our water, um, I'm I'm much more comfortable and much more confident leaning on the uh, leaning in the direction of uh, going with companies that have significant experience in these types of projects. Um, with my uh, with with um, experience that I have in, in working uh, in the space of uh, workforce diversity and, and uh, supplier diversity with uh, not just the construction industry but other industries. Um, what I've learned about construction is, again, at, at the end of the day, it's, it's not really about whether or not a company can perform the job. But I think, again, for certain projects, certain jobs, uh, I think that there is wisdom in, in uh, going with the organizations that uh, have been involved with, um, with the project, uh, similar in nature, and, again, and have the, have the the, uh, the experience to prove it. And so I, I'm much more comfortable uh, with the combination of a Davis and a Franklin Holwerda uh, compared to the fact, and, and again, this is, I'm relying heavily on the recommendation of staff uh, who, again, understands, especially in this day and age, the importance of making sure that we don't make any mistakes as it pertains to our water and our water quality. And so um, I have uh, no problem. And as for the, the DBE, I think I'd be more inclined to grab hold of the uh, the, the minority contractor. Uh, I would love to find ways to pull him or her in uh, and provide additional opportunities uh, that we have available here uh, in the city as well as the county uh, for contractual opportunities. And again, uh, I think that would be of greater benefit uh, in, in the long road. I mean, in, in the long run. So again, I'm in support of Davis. Okay. Yep. All right, commissioners. Any other questions? Well, just I just want to make it very clear that I, you know, we I know everyone around this table is very interested in getting minority contracting mm -hmm. um, opportunities. So that is not the issue. This for me was more about um, the experience and the particular types of construction work that these companies did. I have a lot of respect for both of them and the great work that we see <coughs> in the city by Triangle. So it's nothing about uh, that. It's just this particular water system job. I, I think that it needs to go to someone we've worked with, because it's 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 a. I understand the desire because it's a huge, it's a huge amount of work. So that both companies would, all these companies would want to have it, but at the same time, it's our obligation to make sure that we, we, with all the information that's provided to us, that we try to make the best decision for the, those that are going to be drinking our water in the city. I have um, one other question <clears throat> uh, because this I'm really struggling with this because I I am very concerned about the even the perception of of impropriety and we've heard from a lot of contractors and subcontractors in our community who are really concerned about this that uh, that when you allow subjectivity to come in especially around a decision even though I have great respect for our staff and I know that the team has spent a lot of time on this and I I deeply appreciate that. Uh, so I'm, I am concerned about that. I, my question is, is that when we have a bid where there is concern about the qualifications or competence of a contractor, what, what process do we have in place to, as Commissioner Lanier said, notify them or disqualify them? You know, I think it's easier for us to control who submits a bid. Um, for instance, we recently bid road and mill resurface contracts, and we opened that up to just the road contractors, and some of the asphalt primes around town had concern that we were, you know, limiting their ability to bid this project. And we were not doing that. We were limited, lim limiting their ability to bid as a prime, but they were still allowed to bid as a subcontractor to the road, road prime. So. We can't always choose who contractors list as their subcontractors. That we really have no control over that, other than you know we have our pre-qualification um, process, and, and that 
I think could be improved by maybe expanding some of the categories to broaden um, what's covered in each category. <coughs> but um, so we really can't control who they list as a sub. Um, you know, that's really a business decision for them. Okay. Well, I think through this process, <clears throat> we. Uh, definitely have opportunities for some improvement. I know um, commissioners have talked to me even about not just the pre-qualification process, but also the bid discount process. Uh, and also um, doing the follow-up to confirm and also maybe even putting in some additional weight about the size of, of um, subcontracts with minority-owned businesses versus the amount of the discount. So sure. I think there are a number of things that we, yeah. after we cast That's the vote today and decide what we want to do, that we need to follow up on, and I'll, I'll trust Tom to do that. Uh, <clears throat> so with that, commissioners, any other questions? So with that, I will call the question. This is to uh, the resolution is awarding a contract with Triangle for the pretreatment system at Lake Michigan <coughs> Filtration oh, Plant. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Nay. Nay. It carries. I'm an aye. All right. All right, commissioners, next that will take us to our last item. Um, so commissioners, uh, I would like to invite up Art Davis, who we have been working with for several months now. He's from Springstead Waters. Um, he is the point person for our work in doing our city manager search. So I'm gonna turn this over to Art, um, just to give you an update. I know many of you know, the uh, advisory subcommittee has been meeting uh, really walking through not just process, but also uh, making a recommendation on who we would like to move forward to interview. And so I'm just going to turn it over to Art. Um, first, I want to thank our city attorney publicly for her uh, ed dedication, hard work, many, many hours uh, that she has put into this process. She's been the point person and lead uh, in, at the city uh, and has been in communication with Art. and. Uh, Today, we want to present uh, five candidates to move forward, and I'll just turn it to Art to take it away. Welcome. Honorable Mayor and, and uh, City Commissioners, thank you so much for the opportunity to be here today. Um, we've been working on this for uh, three months now, and um, um, we're wrapping up the fourth month, which is typically what it, how long it takes to uh, recruit a new city manager. Um, we started back on March 27th. Um, I've been here several times meeting with the uh, uh, city manager search sub subcommittee and uh, we met yesterday and the subcommittee is, uh, they've, they've evaluated a, a group of qualified applicants and they are making a recommendation uh, to the city commission to interview five candidates. Those five candidates are uh, Mr. Tom Almonte uh, from Grand Rapids, city of Grand Rapids. Mr. Pete Auger, Auger from uh, City Manager of Novi, Michigan. Uh, Mr. Mike Cernich, uh, City Manager from Tam Tamarack, Florida. Uh, Miss April McGrath Lynch, City Manager from Ferndale, Michigan. And uh, Mr. Mark Washington, Assistant City Manager uh, for the City of Austin, Texas. So we have two. Uh, uh, candidates from outside of Michigan, Texas and Florida, and three candidates from the state of Michigan. Um, all are uh, extremely qual well qualified, uh, competent, and I think you've got a very strong uh, candidate pool to consider for uh, uh, your, to be your next city manager. And the, the, uh, as uh, recommended by the uh, subcommittee, um, Travel arrangements are in process, and all five have committed to be here next Monday and Tuesday as part of uh, the public uh, process of interviewing for this position. So, Mayor, and I'd, I'd be willing to answer any questions or uh, wish you well and see you next week. Yeah. So, thank you, Art, and thanks for sitting through a very long meeting. I think, I think we warned you of that. Um, so, commissioners, just a couple of things. Uh, we're not taking a formal vote today. What I'd like to do is, um, with head nods, just to approve moving forward with these five candidates. Um, and then I want to walk through one more time the process. I know uh, that a press release will be going out momentarily to, again, remind the community about the process. Uh, but just so all of us are really clear, so next week, Monday and Tuesday, they're going to be full days for the candidates, for us, 
There will be a community forum in the evening starting at 5.30 at the library. Um, the forum will provide an opportunity for the candidates to say a, a few words, um, answer a few questions, and then there will be an informal reception where members of the community can spend one-on-one -on -one time with the candidates. Uh, there will be um, an opportunity for city employees to meet the candidates um, earlier in the day on Monday. There will be tours provided for all of the candidates. Um, both our city attorney and Art will be present for those tours. Uh, it, there will be a community reception on Tuesday, and then we will be uh, doing interviews, first round interviews, uh, on Tuesday starting at 2 o'clock. Likely we'll go to about 8 o'clock at night. All of that will be um, open to the public, uh, will be on live stream. And so those will be two busy days. Um, we will have the option of, at the end of our interviews, uh, making a recommendation if there's one candidate that we feel very strongly about, we can always entertain uh, a conversation at that point on who we would like to appoint. Uh, we do have the following week, Tuesday in the morning, set aside for a special meeting to, if we want to do additional interviews or have additional conversations and make the decision on the 7th. So we will have a little flexibility um, if we want to use it. The community is, uh, so the community has a, a full week before we meet these candidates uh, to, to do their own research. I know that's something we heard last time. People felt like they weren't given enough uh, time before we publicly announced who the candidates were to really take a look at these candidates. So um, hopefully during this week, we'll start to hear some feedback from the community. I'm sure we will. We encourage anyone from the community to reach out to us. Uh, you know, the full commission or your uh, ward commissioners. And then at our forum on Monday evening, we'll have comment cards where people can give written feedback or there will be an email set up uh, specifically for feedback. And I know Amy is shaking her head. I believe that city manager at? Just manager. Oh, just manager. Manager at grcity.us. So if anyone wants to email that, um, that will compile all of the feedback from the community and then we will all have access to that feedback. So we'll have a few mechanisms in place uh, for people to weigh in and give us their thoughts. Uh, commissioners, any, any questions? I feel that we have some, some really strong candidates uh, before us and um, again, I know Art put a lot of work into this, a lot of recruitment time, and I appreciate all of his work. But do you have any questions, concerns, thoughts? I want to uh, also appreciate my two colleagues who worked on the subcommittee. Yeah. Commissioner? Yes, I want to thank them too for, for all your work on the subcommittee. It's a, a lot of extra time in a very busy, busy season. It's not supposed to be that busy in the summer. And Art, <laughs> thank you too. Um, Mayor, you did an impressive job from memory. Um, wondering, can you remind us where we can get that whole list, that whole schedule? Because we're going to get asked about we the are. public hearings when we meet yes. and we're making a decision. Yes. It's all in one place. It's all in one place. Um, press release will be going out to all of our media contacts. Um, it'll also be on our web page. Uh, and then you can post it or you can share it with your your contacts and constituents. Uh, it'll be sent out to all of our neighborhoods. So we have a, a email distribution list. Uh, then and that entire distribution list will get access to the press release that has the details of the community forum and the interviews. Excellent. Yes. Thanks. Thanks. All right. Any other comments? Uh, city attorney. Maybe just add that we have a city manager search web page, and on that web page will be all of the resum the <laughs> resumes, so the community and the media can all access the resumes on the web page. Great, thank okay. you for Good saying much. that. And we'll go ahead and repost that web page. Uh, it is a great web page. Uh, one item on that web page is an FAQ. So that was another thing we heard uh, through our last process is that people wanted a much better understanding of the role of a city manager versus an elected body. And so uh, we had a great team who worked on coming up with a pretty thorough FAQ. Uh, and you're welcome to disseminate that information as well. I don't think we need a motion. We had talked about that. Um, this is just the, do we need a motion to move that five forward? Oh. Yeah, I think, I think we're good. So, um, so these are five candidates that will move forward. Um, and again, we have a really strong, diverse pool of candidates and we're excited to meet them. All right, any other comments? I do All have right. one before you adjourn okay. the meeting. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, thank you so much, Art, while I have the floor and you're standing there for all of your hard work. Um, but my other comment is um, we will have interviews this afternoon um, for the third ward um, commissioner candidates at 4 p.m. 
So if you don't have anything to do and you want to hang out with us for another few hours, come on back at 4 p.m. We'll yes. be right in this spot. Yes, indeed. Three candidates. Three? Thank you. Thank you. So yes, we have a big day ahead of us. We have three um, candidates we'll be interviewing for third ward. We also have legislative committee, uh, and there's one item I want to talk about at legislative. So my colleagues on the legislative committee, we're going to meet down in 527. Why don't we take about 10 minutes so we can grab something to eat and get something to drink, and use the restroom. Uh, and I believe that there's food downstairs in the executive office. So help yourself to that. And with that, we are adjourned. Good job, Mayor.